Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this, a very special episode of the KLU Keep Looking Up podcast. Tonight, we have with us, first of all, Anton on camera for the first time ever. Uh, And then, yeah, (laughs) and then our amazing guest, Stephen Bassett, uh, who most of you probably have seen around because he is like the big lobbyist for ufos and has been for quite some time uh at congress um yeah but this is this is a great day so welcome and thanks for being here with us activist Lobby- should i say activist instead I'm a registered lobbyist but i don't do much lobbying in, in a right. sense people know uh, uh, so uh, my work is basically best described as activism Even and uh, a disclosure activist too. And that's the focus always has been. But my first question is what is in that cup, sir? Yes, that tea. is the first question. I make my own tea. Ooh, very oh, nice. Try to break my sugar addiction. <laughs> oh, it's hard. It's stevia yeah. is a great alternative. It is the best alternative, but you I have see. to get stevia that doesn't have erythritol in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, some do, but I get the best stuff. Oh, that's yeah. really good. I like I like honey as my alternative to sugar. I've been drinking black tea with honey in the mornings, but it's you know it's still sugary. Um, but that's that's me. I also make my own tea blends, so I approve. <laughs> I'm not fancy. This is decaffeinated, <laughs> unsweetened Nestle's instant tea. <laughs> so delicious. <laughs> on, but I make it a gallon at a time, so it's good. What right are you on. drinking, Anton? I am drinking some whiskey. I Ooh, seem to be of course. one. Figured I would celebrate. Yeah, I normally would be drinking whiskey, but I'm doing a like 24 hour, not like doing any alcohol or anything like that, just for the next 24 hours. So today it is a pumpkin spice hey, right latte on. instead. So the way things are going, well, I'll be drinking whiskey 24 and seven. Oh boy. Okay. So words, let's, let's get into it. So. I don't know if you want to start, like, I feel like most people watching this or listening to this um, know who you are, but let, we have some, actually some audience members who aren't familiar so much with the political side of things on this. So do you want to explain in brief for your activism, like what it is that you do, you're doing here? I'm a political activist. The issue I chose was the government's policy regarding the extraterrestrial presence. Uh, The, uh, my, most of my life, I sort of paid attention, but not focused on it. Didn't join anything. It, no, no formal interest at all. But right. I, I came to a decision in nineteen ninety five that I wanted to be an activist. I'd always sort of been one, but never really committed. So I chose this issue for a lot of reasons. Uh, and I was aware of various books and the research, the endless efforts to prove it. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, over again, and but it never got accepted, yeah. and that was very frustrating. Uh, but I got involved. Uh, I went to uh, volunteer for John Max uh, organization in, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Spent there four years. Was there for four years. Wow. And I had an epiphany that it had been proven. It had been proven years ago. It had been proven many times over. So what's the problem? The problem is that. It's a political decision on the United States government to embargo it. It's not a lie so much as it is an embargo. Uh, in other words, they 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 are lying and they lie a lot, but this is an embargo. It's a formal effort to prevent confirmation of this issue in the public. Uh, it is a national security matter. It's a political decision. And I realized then the solution, if we were going to get the information, we had to have a political solution. But there there was no no lobbyist. It had ever lobbied on the issue, probably because the pay was zero and uh, it was still stigmatized. But I didn't care. I had had no, nothing blocking me from doing this. I had prepared myself perfectly to do this by not 
establishing any kind of a um, um, attachments to uh, a family, you know, large sums of money, career, whatever, ah, is completely free. So I just jumped, jumped right in. So for the last 25 years, uh, I raised the lobby's fine. I, I, I established a political action committee, which is now suspended. These are all just somewhat formalities that you do to show people that it's real and therefore it should have a uh, a, a, a lobbyist. It should have a political action committee. It's like a university. To really be a university it needs to have teachers. And if it doesn't have any teachers, then you're going to go, well, it's, it's no university, is there? So these were markers I laid down. Uh, but for the last 25 years, everything I've done, going to conferences, holding conferences, any writing, websites, podcasts, social media, everything that I have done has one, one simple goal. And that is to do what I could to assist the U.S. government to get to where it needed to get so that it could confirm that we are not alone. It will be the most important announcement in human history, uh, that confirmation. A lot of people already know it. And there are certain people that have already said it, but they weren't the head of a state. They weren't the president of the United States, premier of China, you know, president or president of, of Russia it, it, or, or France or England. It, no one no one at the head of state has done this, but others have, but that doesn't count because it's not going to change policy. It's not going to open doors. It's not going to completely eliminate the, the huge number of barriers that are there for the people to, 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 to learn and start to become up to speed on this. So that's been my goal for 25 years. I didn't think it would take this long. I I didn't think so. Uh, but history is a way of getting in the way of, of our what best laid plans of mice and men off gang go aglay. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And one of the reasons they go aglay is that history is a big river moving forward in one direction. And we don't redirect history. We just sail our boat through it and try to navigate a little bit, maybe land somewhere or get a, get a particular spot, and the river will take you somewhere else. So it's been an interesting 26 years. That's oh, yeah. what I do, political activist. Political <laughs> activist, I love it. Do you do you think that, the, like, I mean, I'm going to jump around a little bit here, but do you think that this has to be announced by the president in order for it to be taken seriously? And I'm not saying our president, but a head of office, like, do you think there has to be that big, you know, my fellow Americans, we are not alone, like that that speech has to occur? Or do you think that if this just keeps leaking out, eventually people will just kind of, I mean, most of us, like, you know, Anton, myself, others we've had on the show, we accept that these things are true and real. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of like getting the confirmation from the government. So, so how do you feel about that? Do you think that it has to happen in order for it to be acknowledged at this point? Yes, of course. But yeah. here's the here's a simple analogy. Um, it's been leaking out for since '47. Yeah. In every way you can imagine. Uh, fine. But that's not disclosure. That's not the yeah. formal confirmation. So even so, it's been leak, leaking out for 75 years. How many universities in the United States have an accredited course on the extraterrestrial issue? As far as I know, there's only, well, there's still zero. Okay. I know I've seen there's one course out there on exopolitics, but that's that's all I know. My, and it's probably not even accredited. Probably not. And some of these things are, are, are set up, private deals, they set them up. But in terms of your standard university colleges, ne never and never have been. The closest thing was some courses that David Jacobs taught at Temple until he retired. Hmm. So that's what, 75 years? Hmm. So obviously that leaking, those, the, the slow leaks that have taken place wasn't enough. Uh, is, was, was there any legislation dealing with this extraordinary issue? Not until 2020. Yeah. Which was what? Uh, uh, 73 years into the embargo. There was the first legislation. How many hearings have there been? Two brief hearings in oh, 67, 66 and 68 and not, not, not another hearing for 53, 55 years. That's why the president has to confirm it. Uh, and when I say head of state, uh, it doesn't have to be our president, but you can be assured that if the president of, if uh, Xi Jinping confirms the ET presence, which I'm sure will be followed by some very fine evidence that is in the hands of the Chi Chinese uh, uh, communist government, or or Putin, or even um, a cynic of um, of um, the UK. 
uh, our president will probably confirm it within days. All right. So, again, if if, if uh, the premier of China confirms it, it's confirmed. But if that if it stopped there, then a lot of people would say he's pulling a, a hoax, a, a psyop. He's he's playing games or something. Uh, and so but it won't. Right. Because this issue is worldwide. It is has been studied worldwide. The uh, the level of awareness of the issue is worldwide. And so the idea that one head of state would announce it and the others would go, well, I don't know, and then make complete fools of themselves, right? And and an, and an ass before history, no. So it will start with a head of state and it will go around the world like that. It would be probably in the world's best interest if the U.S. went first, but it is not essential to the long-term outcomes. Uh, I'm somewhat biased as an American citizen, but... I'm not just a citizen of a country. I'm the citizen of the country with the most powerful nuclear weapon system, though it's a, you know, just barely ahead of the next two, certainly the next, the last one, and also one of the great economies and a great bastion for democracy when it's practicing democracy. And so, for us to be the first, is going to put a certain, how would you say, tone to it. Yeah. Uh, and it will also, and it's all. And there's another reason. The U.S. has, by and large, been the leader of this truth embargo. In other words, except for the major communist powers, all the other nations have looked to us and gone, look, if you're not ready to say anything, if you're not confirmed, it's okay, it's all right. We want to have good relationships with you. We have huge economic ties and so forth. We've led this embargo for 75 years. And so if we don't end it, it just is going to make it a lot harder on the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, the military services. We we're going to be asked incredibly difficult questions, which they will, in a post-disclosure world, have to tell the truth. And the truth is going to be extremely uncomfortable. It will be a lot less uncomfortable if our country leads the disclosure event. I like that. That's very well that's said. Um, I really wanted to comment on this. On the, You brought up national security. That's kind of my stance on this whole thing. Um I'm an American citizen as well, and I mean, just observing this issue, I obviously haven't been involved as long and as thorough as you have, but I mean, it doesn't take long to see that why would a country want to disclose such information and put themselves in, in a disadvantage from a geopolitical point of view? I mean, if they have access to these alleged reverse engineering legacy programs, why would they tell China and Russia what they have? and put themselves in a position where, let's say, China and Russia have their own programs and they see what we have, they're not really entitled to say anything about that, you know? And, the, and, it, and it also, when you disclose this information, I feel like there needs to be a long-term disclosure here because there's no telling how different factions of the public will react. You know, there's a lot of religious people in the world who will probably be very mixed on this. Um, how disruptive will these technologies be to the economy? You know, there's there's all kinds of stuff that I feel like uh, that uh, people need to start looking at on this topic. Hmm. But had, yeah, I was gonna say, how do you feel about that? Because this is where he and I sometimes differ. This is like the only yeah. only thing that he <laughs> and I disagree on when it comes to disclosure. I think. Well, we knew the U.S. government knew about the ET presence and had technology no later than forty seven July. There's some possibility they may have had that knowledge and some tech prior to that, though obviously very closely held, extremely closely held. Uh, maybe we'll get, we'll learn that at some point. We know that they were well aware of the Foo Fighter events happening in all, all theaters of combat, but there's some possible possibilities of crashes prior to 47. But we know about 47 because somebody who meant well put out a press release. So no later than 47, government's known about the ETs and has had crafts. So they've had 75 years to control the issue, embargo the issue. And um, the, con the concerns about social and societal disruption it, it probably would have been more appropriate in 47 to 52 than they would be now. Uh, but uh, it, I can make a very powerful case that they were bogus then, right? And... Uh, Societal disruption would not have happened then. It won't happen now. Societal disruption was one of the memes of the truth embargo. It was a scare thing. 
Okay. You don't go in the closet. Don't go in the attic because there's a, there's a uh, there's a go go ghost up there, right? Or uh, uh, you know uh, you know lethal insects or something. Anything they they put out whatever would keep us off the issue. Uh, and the arguments for societal disruption have been weak, if not completely bogus, from the get go. In 1947, the United States had just gone through a world war. 100 million people would die. Unbelievable sacrifice. Men and men in combat by the millions. Right? We we experienced the first nuclear bombs. We we, we experienced them being dropped on uh, on, on human beings. Um, we came through it. The Russians came through it. They lost more than we did. So the idea that people back then learning there's a, there's a, there's non humans out there, and they're just going to fall to pieces. Is ludicrous, utterly ludicrous. Now, in 2014, 2023, rather, that's why I had 14 in my mind, 2023, uh, over 600 films about ETs have been produced by the Hollywood and film industry in the UK and the United States. I don't know about India and some of the other countries, but about 600 films, uh, many of them the highest grossing films of all time. They've been seen billions of times. They go back to 51. So, whoa. Suddenly we learn that there's actually ETs after watching 600 films about ETs that everybody's going to run screaming around in the street? No. Now, the principal national security issue that has maintained the truth embargo were these two, primarily. One, they knew early on that, that things were not going to go well with the Soviet Union. They knew that that there was going to be some kind of serious problem, which could very well be a nuclear war. They, they anticipated the possibility of a World War III that was nuclear, which would have been obviously beyond bad. And then with that in mind, and not knowing what the technology was capable of doing or what, what they could learn from it in 47, 8, 9, 51, 52, whatever, they decided, hey, we've got to we've got to maintain the control of this. We've got to keep it private until we determine this. Plus, they they had no reason to not think that something like this had happened in the Soviet Union. China was less of an issue. China was in a very poor state at that point, very backward. Uh, it it moved fast, but still, the, the problem was the Soviet Union. And so, not surprisingly, they 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 wanted to embargo it and see where things went. P perfectly reasonable, and of course. They didn't know to what extent the ET uh, uh, presence was. Uh, was it hostile? Could it become hostile? Or was there more than one group? All of these things they did not know. And so they decided we'll embargo this issue. Uh, they took five years to consider it. And as of 52, they still hadn't made a decision uh, to formally install an embargo. They were riding the fact that that was an era of, of post-war uh, reconstruction. The economy was good. People were very much taken up. And there was a war in Korea. And so it just wasn't coming up until the big sighting events, flap, uh, UFO flap, over um, the Capitol in 1952, which really frightened them. Because if these ETs are willing to fly over our Capitol anytime they want for days, which they did, what, what are we going to do about that? How 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 what how, what what are we going to do? And so they 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 conducted a study through the ECIA that became to be called the Robertson Panel to come up with a what can we do scenario. And there was a couple of ways they could have gone, but they made a historic choice, a profoundly historic choice. The choice should have been if you can't stop them from flying over the Capitol, which you can't anytime they want then this is going to go on and the government's going to be in an increasingly awkward position. Therefore, in 1953, under a very revered, very serious president who was beloved by many, a war hero and so forth, uh, disclose it, confirm it to the American people and say, we're going to learn more. We're going to let you know and so forth. They could have done that in 53 and changed the entire course of the 20th century, which for those that have been paying attention, 
hasn't gone, gone that well. But they chose another way. The way was this. And they acknowledged it in the report, which is doubly irritating. The phenomena appeared to not be a threat, but the growing public interest in it was. And therefore, we must contain that public interest and thus began the formal the formal uh, truth embargo that I came, what I came to call it uh, in uh, 2000, maybe 1999, somewhere in there is where I basically said, no, it's not a, it's not a early on. I think I'm saying it on Art Bell. I mean, it's not a cover up. It's a national security policy. It's like, like saying our, our nuclear missile program is a cover up. You know, we have these hidden, you know, these nuclear missiles and you can't go see them and, and uh, you know, they could do, and they're, they're covering up. No. It's national security policy. It was legal. Therefore, cover a cover up was wrong and not appropriate. So I called it the truth embargo. So that's how it happened. And and as I've said many times, they didn't know where things were going to go. So when they embargoed it, when they formally embargoed it in early 53, the the the, the future was still quite unclear. And and they were thinking, okay, at some point we're going to be able to bring this forward. Let's see what happens. And the, the Korean War ended in 55. Um, but by then, the Soviets had tested atomic and nuclear weapons and were building missiles because they had their own German paperclip program. I don't know what they called it in Russian. but And they were building missiles and nuclear weapons. They knew what was coming next they knew exactly what was going to come next a nuclear arms race and so but how bad would it get could we steer away from it could some you know sort of president with extremely high quality diplomatic uh, skills work out a deal with the soviets that we wouldn't go down that road well it might have happened it didn't what happened was one of the most grotesque eras in a, all of human history in which eight ultimately nine nations so it could be more by the mid 1980s had built and stockpiled or had ready for launch 86,000 nuclear weapons enough to end pretty much civilization 10 times over spent trillions of dollars doing this and under the 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 cover of mutual assured destruction where the nuclear powers could never go to war with each other right which was something all right because obviously world war one and world war two show that they could very well do that so uh it was awful yeah it was awful and so every year going after 53 things just got worse and worse and worse and so nobody was going to be able to convince the national security structures that now's the time to tell everybody about the ETs. The situation was just too dangerous. It's like tossing this massive uh, variable into an already incredibly complex equation without having the slightest idea how it would affect the answer. So they decided to keep, they had to hang on. Their next opportunity was 91 when the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, but for various reasons, they didn't take that opportunity. So, that is how we ended up with a 75 year, uh, 75, 47, yeah, 76, 76 years of embargo on this thing. So the problem then is how do you get out of it? Right? I mean, I understand how, why they stayed in it. And it, it, it took a lot of effort and time and money and skills uh, using all of their resources, and they have a lot, uh, and they pulled it off, and they pulled it off in a democratic republic, which is amazing, and a, 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 a dictatorship. One could say, yeah, sure, but a democratic republic with the First Amendment, how did they pull it off? It wasn't easy. They had to go to extraordinary lengths, and there were minimum casualties. The same kind of thing held in, in, in other countries that we know of. There would have been lots of casualties, but not here. Uh, so the problem now is how do you get out of it? And that's what's been going on the last five years. They're getting out of it, right? Finally, yep. right? And not because the public is now ready for it, right? But because the public is so aware 
and the new technology is putting such enormous pressure on the government. Cell phones, computers, social media, the internet, uh, worldwide communications, the ability to translate websites. The result of that, which starts in the late 1990s, when I when I come in, I was very fortunate because without the internet and all this other stuff, there'd been no hope. Uh, you've got a world right now where the, uh, I guess you would call market penetration of just the concept of extraterrestrial and UFO is probably running around 95%, meaning 95% of the 8 billion people on this planet know what you mean when you say in your their language, an extraterrestrial or UFO. Now, any business with a 95% mar mar marketing put, uh, penetration worldwide would be the biggest built business in the world. It would probably have income of 50 billion, $100 billion a year, maybe more. I mean, it's unbelievable. And so, Pressing up against that and all the technology that's come along was simply impossible. It was no way. They had done a good job, but it was over. And so the consensus inside, I think, by 2014, 15, was that this is going to end pretty soon. And what do you do? And what happened was a group emerged in 2017, private. They went private. They couldn't do this while they were employed. Uh, and to try to trip it, to try to hit the switch. Uh, that group is was came out in a, under a, a aegis of a To the Stars Academy of Arts and Scientists. Science, there that has changed, and some of them stayed with the, uh, then the, th several left and moved forward. Uh, and these were the key people, Elizondo, Nolan, and uh, and, and Mellon, uh, to pursue the, the ultimate reason for the, all of this was to end the truth embargo. So that is, and, that's been going on now for some time, and we're all fine. I assure you, all the problems that you see in the world, which are overwhelming, have nothing to do with the ET issue, right? In fact, the ET issue, as turns out, may be the safe space that they can go to to actually get together again and start making some changes and reforms because it's basically nonpartisan. It's actually the best chance we have. Uh, so in these 75 years, We've conducted dozens and dozens of wars under the nuclear weapons, mutual assured destruction umbrella, killed huge numbers of people, destroyed untold trillions of dollars of stuff, right? Committed genocides, right? Uh, built up vast weaponry still, but not at the level of 86,000 nukes, but new kinds of weapons, new technology, bi bacterial weapons, genetic weapons, you name it. They're even working on, believe it or not, antimatter weapons, but they don't talk about that. No. And so- Believe me, the last thing we need to be concerned about is whether some religious people or just some people who are just naturally a little bit phobic are going to lose it when we get an ET presence announced. It is nearly at the bottom of the list, right? But it is a wonderful tool for the truth embargo, a tool that I simply will not uh, use. I reject it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Great answer. Anton, do you feel like that addressed your points? I think it touched base on some of it. Um, I just, I mean, I think you, you're right. I mean, it shouldn't be specifically for religious people. I was more so focused on the point of the how it, disclosure is framed, in my opinion, is pretty much how this is going to play out because the United States or any government really could say whatever they want. And if whoever controls disclosure, and ideally, like you said, like I'd rather it be the United States, it's going to follow a series of questions, and it, the United States is not necessarily obligated to answer all those questions. They can pretty much say whatever they want to skew it to where they are dominating the future of what this presence might entail, whatever that presence might be. Um, you're right. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's just it, I'm more worried about humans than than NHI or or anything else. Um, but at the same time as dangerous as humans can be, I really do agree with that point that we can really be unified. And in my opinion, I think disclosure should be a multi-step process to get to that point where we are a unified humanity. Right, well, again, we're, we're, language is important here. Yeah. Disclosure, the small d disclosure is a fairly straightforward, innocuous term. It's, it just means revealing things. That's what the small d disclosure is revealing things. So you disclose a little of this, you disclose a little of that. 
And that's been going on for 75 years. That's not the disclosure that I'm talking about. Disclosure is a capital D. It's confusing, I, I admit. But I, I don't regret going this way. When I coined the capital D disclosure term, which is a proper noun, disclosure is a noun too, but disclosure with capital D is a proper noun because it names an event like Christmas or Halloween. The event is the confirmation event. Just that and nothing more. And so when they say disclosure will do this and disclosure will do that, now what they're really referring to is what happens after capital D disclosure. So the goal of the activist movement is to simply get that confirmation. Yes. And then whatever happens after that, whatever the government's choices may be, to lie, to not lie, to evade, whatever, it's going to be in a wholly different world and context. Because first of all, all the major countries will confirm disclosure. They're, they're all going to confirm the ET presence. And so that's going to be known worldwide uh, and confirmed by every head of state that is appropriate. Some countries are so tiny and small, it doesn't matter, though they may do it too. What the hell? Right? And so everything that happens is going to be in that context. And so the real question is, how will the small d disclosure process go in the post-confirmation era? What will we learn? When will we learn it? How um, will the government still continue to be mendacious or will they play it straight? Yeah. All right. And so forth. Um, there will be, will, will the government try to use this new paradigm and some way to, to somehow get something or go somewhere we don't want them to go, but it's just another tool for them? It's possible. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not too worried about it because in the in the context that i'm referring to the context in which the entire world has just learned two very important things we are not alone and every government on the planet that was in a position to know which is quite a few of these governments has not told us the truth about this for 75 years all right that's what they're going to know all right. yeah. and, and they, they've suspected it and some people even knew it but it, it's, it's in a context where that's been confirmed. And so in that circumstance, when you combine that with the technological power uh, available to humans now, the internet, uh, social media, uh, high-level communications, the ability to communicate worldwide, form groups, do activism worldwide, online, whatever, uh, where billions of people, if they want to, could watch the same press conference live. Uh, the uh, just to make that point, the world last World Cup final was actually watched live by 1.5 billion people. That just gives you an idea of the level of technology. And while I have nothing against soccer, I can say that the implications from and the potential interest in major events surrounding the ET issue surpasses soccer. And so I can envision a situation after disclosure where something takes place and 4 billion people are watching it live. That is the context of the post-disclosure world. And so any uh, uh, bureaucrat, uh, military person, uh, member of government, head of state, legislature, or whatever, who is being queried in a formal way about this issue, who chooses to lie or try to manipulate is going to get crucified. Whatever lie he tells, the internet will have already digested it, taken it apart, put it back together again and published the actual truth. At the same time, they're calling for this person to be removed, fired, right? If not jailed, boom, just like that. Because when you got that many people looking in the same direction, you you want to definitely be on your best behavior. So that's uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm not so worried. Uh, and uh, another reason is that once the onus of the truth embargo is over, there will be a process of revealing information. Now the government will generally control this. But they are highly incentivized to be 
reasonable. And so in the post-disclosure world, there should only be two things in terms of this issue, if not every issue. Either you give the truth or you say you're not able to answer it and you give the reason for that, which you're already seeing happening. It happened in the Grusha hearing and it's happened in many hearings. I can't to speak to that in the public sector, but I'll speak to you in a private sector or in a skip, whatever. At least the public knows there's an answer and the public knows that individuals in government that have the clearance are hearing that information so that at some time later they'll get it. And if the balance between these two things, the truth or I can't answer that in this open circumstance is reasonable, then the public is going to be uh, pretty happy with that, meaning they're going to keep getting information, they're going to learn more and more, and they're going to know more and more about what is still being withheld. Now, that's a pretty good situation for everybody concerned. And so the idea that somebody says, well, I think I'll just go out and lie, I just go out and lie, you know, I'll tell them, nah, nah, we don't have that, we don't have that. And, and throw away their legacy and their career and make an ass of themselves in front of the entire world? No, they're not going to do it. Yeah. Now, again, other countries, it may vary. Russia and China are, are going to have uh, their own unique problems here because they're control states. Their, their government, their leaders basically thrive and remain in power by pretty much controlling what people think, do, read, say, and go to, to what various degrees. And so consequently, under the scrutiny of the post-disclosure world, where lying really is a huge mistake, they really have a dilemma. However, what may serve the truth well is that, as we already know, and it's been talked about quite a bit, certainly I've talked about it, there's probably no less political issue in the world today than the ET presence. It's just damn near impossible to politicize the ET presence. Now, you might politicize what you do with re-engineered tech. I mean, you could a little bit. You could, but still, you have to struggle even then. It's 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 really a nonpartisan issue. And so I think some of these control states like China, like Russia, may actually surprise us with how candid they are about answering the questions regarding the ET issue yeah. uh, post-disclosure. But there may be some countries where the leader just isn't going to play ball. Who knows? But what really matters is how well the major powers handle it. And what matters to us is how well the United States. Plus, you see, every nation that handles this well and provides increasing amounts of information uh, and, and making it clear when they cannot divulge because of classifications, national security, whatever, every country that does that, uh, makes it that much harder for any holdouts to to say, well, I just don't want to talk about it or you know, they give some super ridiculous uh, explanation yeah. because they're just they're already they're they're basically sticking out like a nail. Right. And somebody in the Internet's going to come along and pound them. Right. The Internet's going to be a hammer. It's going to pound them back in. And so yeah. there's going to be a great deal of peer pressure globally for nations to be competing with who can tell the most truth to some degree. Lying will be a negative and telling the truth will be a positive. And it is in that context. And the reason I do what I do is that we may have the opportunity in the post-disclosure world for this reason just discussed as well as the, the overall worldview change that is likely to take place amongst quite a few people, billions of people, we may have a chance to fix this mess. I'm not sure, I mean, it's not a guaranteed but we may have a chance to fix this god awful mess that we have created, which has got uncountable numbers of problems, crises, turning points that we've already passed, points of no return, uh, threads of development which we can't control, uh, way overpopulated, and on and on and on and on. We have really screwed things up. Now you may say, well, does it? If you're living well. And you're insulated from all that. Why should you care? Very good point. And that's where many people like that are. I'm good. Don't care. But the problems that we are headed towards, I assure you, will come to everybody's door. I don't care how many billions of dollars you're worth. I don't care how many private planes you own. The shit that we have created is eventually going to be on your doorstep and take you down. And I hope that they will start to get that message, particularly in the post-disclosure era. Uh, so we'll see. 
Anyway, that's that's the real payoff yeah. for the activist movement. Getting the confirmation is a victory. Yeah. And then the real work begins. The so real work begins. I have two questions based on that. Sorry, Anton, if you have one, I'm sure. Um, you seem, I mean, obviously you're extremely certain that disclosure is coming, like it's based coming. on everything that you just said. Um, and yeah. I can see that too. Is there a chance... Because you, you said that in a previous interview, you said activists need to remain adaptable. So yeah. what what can we do? Because Anton and I, we consider ourselves disclosure activists. We have a lot of other people behind us and other groups that are also activists. What can we do right now to ensure that this happens? And then I guess the second follow-up is what can people who are just like normal people listening do also like are you I've been telling you three of us are not normal I'm... <laughs> oh what I don't know <laughs> why <laughs> no <laughs> well, what is normal anyways right uh, I mean what it. is normal yeah but fair well I'll answer your question do exactly what you're doing keep holding podcasts bring on guests have them discuss yeah. the, have different kinds of people to talk about the post-disclosure world they don't have to be UAP people they could be anthropologists historians or whatever though most of them are reluctant to come on because well they're still, still a little bit afraid you know yeah whatever so, yeah, do what you're doing. Uh, in terms of the overall population, I mean, they're doing plenty. Groups are forming all over the place. New groups are popping up every day, more sophisticated groups approaching the issue. There's now six or seven or eight lobbyists, registered lobbyists. Uh, uh, and that's fine. Uh, and there's plenty happening on the Hill and so forth. So there's plenty happening right now to help ensure, as you say, that we get disclosure. It's zero chance we're going to turn around and go the other way it's not going to happen um so what the easiest thing that the people can do and it seems silly but actually it's very important is social media and the, the twitter is the the best one uh and the reason for that is the polit twitter is the most political of the social media facebook is not is not designed for it I mean, there was a lot of political pages that have been set up over time, and that's fine, and they served a purpose and people interacted, but Facebook is not set up to surface activism very well. TikTok, no. And Instagram, not really. Uh, Twitter is the one. And that is why a majority of all journalists have Twitter accounts. And a majority of all the members of Congress have Twitter accounts. All right. This is where they get feedback. And so it's easy to find them. You just do the search on them, right? And I think some people are compiling. Something I could do is compile a, uh, a, a a total list of handles for every member of Congress. I think it's already been done. I should search for that. That would be something we're sharing. So, yeah. okay. So what does that mean? Uh, when it comes to journalists and movie stars and stuff and members of Congress, uh, very few of them allow DM on their site. On their Twitter page, they don't allow it. Uh, I do. In general, I, I, the percentage of DM is I don't know. It's it's not high, but it's but in terms of uh, people uh, that are public figures, it's pretty low. So you can't DM them. You can always, if you can get their email address, you can send them an email. But that's not that's not cool because when you send them an email, the only person that sees it is their staff, who might pass it on to the member, or the journalist, right? And that's it. But when you send them a message on Twitter, huge numbers of people can see it. They see the message. And so since you can't DM them, what you do is you simply write them or you tweet to them. As, as you know, most people know if you have somebody up, some person up on the screen and you go tweet, it sticks their handle right there at the beginning of the tweet at, you know, Congressman Smith, at, you know, producer, whatever the hell. And then you put a message, which ensures that it's going to turn up on the feed. Okay, so now, now you've gotten your message on the feed of, say, a member of Congress. Is he going to read it? Is she going to read it? Probably not. But somebody is. Because I can assure you, every member of Congress has a staffer that follows their Twitter page and everything that turns up on it. So they can get a feedback as to how people are responding to what they're doing and what's going on it makes total sense and then that person will report something when they feel it appropriate to the member now with journalists 
it's a little different. I, I think some of the high-end journalists may have a staff person assigned to that, but mostly it might be them. Journalists are pretty vain, uh, by and large, and they really want to know what people think of what they're doing. So I think you'd be surprised at how many of them, generally, they check into that feed. Maybe not all the time. They're busy, particularly the, the very busy ones. Okay, I get it. So what am I getting at? It's simple. Praise them into submission. Tell them how appreciative you are that they worked on this bill, made that statement, uh, at anything that they do, anything that they do related to this issue that seems to be positive, you praise them, ba bang, ba bang. And you can send as many praises as you want to the same person, but you spread it around. So what's going on? What, it means that if, if, if a couple of million people were doing that in the United States, there would be praise tweets turning up all over the congressional feeds as well as the top journalists in the country. And the power of praise in our time in particular, is simply just not appreciated. People just don't get it. Yeah. Uh, you, most people are, human nature is quick to condemn and criticize, praise, you gotta pry it out of somebody, right? It's like telling somebody you love them. Some people will know someone for 20 years before they get there. So praise is not as easy to come, but it's not hard. And here's the most powerful thing about praise. When a journalist who is covering the issue, and I know many of them, gets some post on their on their feed that says, you actually believe that, you, you, why are you writing about this? You actually think there's ETs here? Do you wear a tinfoil hat to bed at night? Are you delusional? Whatever. It's nasty. It's called, it's called trolling. It's called shading, whatever. When, do you, you think that person immediately, you know, calls up one of their colleagues or brings that up at lunch the next day? I got this awful tweet telling me I'm an idiot. No, they don't share criticisms. They don't share insults. But when they get praise, they share. And so some high-end journalist gets praise for covering this particular subject in a great way. They, uh, they tell their colleagues that at the next launch. You know, I, I wrote that article, got, got a lot of great feedback on that. So now all of that praise is being shared by the people that are getting it. You see the dynamic here? Yeah. All right. Now, I haven't got the means, the resources to set up some giant praise operation. Believe me, I'm still up to my tuchus in debt and get by month to month. Though I am about to convert to a nonprofit and see if I can raise tax free, uh, tax donate free uh, money, which could expand BRG's operation. Long time coming, but I'm about to do it. That's so I can't do that. But it's not, it's not a big, you know, you don't need some big organization, you know, praise uh, America. Uh, just spread the word. Tell them how much you like what they're doing. Do it through Twitter. Now, I don't really care about Elon Musk or what he's doing or not doing, and I understand the problems with social media. The idea that you could have something that vast with that many people involved and there wasn't going to be bad behavior is really ludicrous, right? So you want to focus on that, everybody you know, gets, starts tearing their hair out. Oh, my God. Hey, look, the simple truth is, is that Twitter, as it happens, is probably the most powerful activist tool that's ever turned up in the history of the human race. Now, you can use it for any purpose you want. You can use it to insult people all day long and troll people and make up stuff and make a fraud or whatever. But you can also use it to collectively drive an issue in a way that's quite extraordinary. You can, you can if, you, if, you, if you do your business well, if you've got what it takes and you reach out to people, you could end up with a million followers. And in Twitter, a million followers is a very significant thing. It's way more significant than, say, 10,000 followers, all right? It's literally a measure of power. Even, even in the TikTok world where you've got people making silly videos and they may end up with 5 or 10 million uh, followers, even though what they're doing is virtually inconsequential, all of those followers literally, by definition, makes them an influencer. Yep. Well, what is activism but influencing, right? And so they, they may not know what to do with that influence. They may waste it, but sometimes they actually go, well, you know, I'm an influencer. And then they'll take a position on something. Oh, everybody's, you know, going. This is the nature of the world today. So 
my simple statement is, look, people, find the handles for the Congress people and the, and the journalist. And if they do anything positive on this issue, tweet them with praise. And that that will have a lot that will have a very powerful effect, more than you might imagine. I love that. So everybody listening, I've been telling you to call your reps every single episode. So now I'm going to say call your reps and tweet the people who are doing all the good work. You're saying don't. You're going to no. say don't call the reps. Any okay, reason? don't call your reps. No, 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 no. See, here's the problem. With, with the calling campaigns, what they do is they just jam the phones up. Hmm. And what are they going to get, right? There's nothing you can say. We want to do such and such and such and such, right? Uh, it, it, so it irritates them. Mm. And so phone, that's now obviously when you say call your reps, not that many do and not that many calls come in, but over a call coming in, you can't really respond at that moment. All you can do is make some standard answer. It accomplishes not much. Now you could call and praise. Okay, you could call and praise. But again, when you call, the only people that hear that call are you and the person on the, the other end. The staffer. Yep, but it's always a staffer. A, when you put a tweet up there, all the people that, that, that see the I've... feed on that tweet see the praise. And so not only are you praising them, but you're letting lots of other people know that you're praising them. You're literally promoting their good behavior to a larger audience. Emails, calls, and letters don't do that. The old the old days were only the letter was the way to go. You sent a letter and they go, oh my God, this person took the time to write a letter. I did a letter writing campaign at the start of all of this. <laughs> so I it's feel like, bad oh, now. I'm Oops. gonna I'm gonna just react. No. No. No, no. I know. It's fine. I it's tried. Okay. It's okay. That it's change is is what it is. And this is a Twitter world. We just live in it. Now, another platform may come along even superior. There are a few things out there and there's, um, but you know, it's when you, the reach that you have, the number of people on the platform, the fact that you can do a Twitter space with two or 300 people literally listening to you in a conference. I've done a couple. It, these are tools that activists from 75 years ago would go, oh my God. I mean, they they were trying to, to defeat government policy with mimeograph machines and <laughs> making up signs and walking around in the street. Those days, that's old, old stuff. Now, some issues, on the other hand, yeah, people will still go to the street. That's happening right now. There's some types of activism and some issues where uh, it goes beyond Twitter. Uh, but these are usually very serious and disturbing issues. Right. Um, Twitter is particularly ideal for orderly social change, uh, which I think this certainly applies to the ET issue. Some yeah. issues need more than that. They're just too heinous. The policy is too awful. And you need to show up and be seen by the media and by the government in the street. I understand that. But this is not one of those issues. Got it. Uh, Anton, you got some questions because I, you know, I got more, but you, you go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you should ask another one. I just wanted to say thank you for all these incredible answers, Mr. Yeah, Johnson. this is great. This is My great. Job. My job. All right. Um, so speaking of post disclosure, because that is something that I wanted to talk about. So on Mind Forked, you talked about that we're about to move into a new world, and um, I've seen. Uh, yeah, like just in general, let's talk about this new world, this new paradigm, you know, post-disclosure, because mm -hmm. again, I think a lot of us are on the same page that it's going to happen. It's just a question of when. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, let's talk. Oh, actually, before I do that, sorry, should have asked this first. You had mentioned months ago that you feel if there are Senate hearings, two weeks later, we're probably going to get disclosure. This upcoming hearing that's in the, the you know, we're hearing about, uh, that's a pun, um, Gillibrand saying that there's going to be a hearing. Is she saying another congressional hearing or is this time it's actually going to be a Senate hearing? Have you heard, do you know what's happening? Hearings are supposed to be the Senate hearings. The House cut in line. Okay. And, uh, yeah. In there. Uh, not surprisingly, not long after the hearing held in the uh, House subcommittee. Uh, the chairman, a very powerful man, a chairman, uh, a Turner, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, which is a notch above the Oversight Committee, announced there would be no more House hearings. Mm -hmm. and that 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 and then that, and that article is up on my news media, art, print media archive at paradigmresearchgroup.org. 
resources, print media archive. It's now up to 15,000 linked articles. 12, 1,400 this year alone, biggest year ever. Not, yeah. not, not that that's all the articles. It's those are curated from twice that many, two, two, three thousand. But those are there's there's limited small end press and and uh, website stuff and so forth. Uh, I, I'm I'm pretty much just curating the the professional journalists, uh, which covers a still substantial spectrum. But we're talking professional journalists, right? 50 articles. So uh, uh, that article turned up, and I don't know. I, I don't have access inside. Uh, I don't roam the halls of Congress and, and have meetings yet. I'm hoping to get there, but as an activist, I'm always going to be the last person invited to the party. Uh, but I'm pretty sure the Senate probably could have it could have been uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer. But somebody in the Senate basically got to some of the House leaders and said, look, guys, this issue is massively significant. And it needs to be handled carefully. And the Senate Intel Committee is the most prestigious committee in Congress, particularly with respect to national security matters. And so we would appreciate it if you would just step aside. There'll be plenty of time for congressional House hearings after disclosure. And there will be plenty of hearings after disclosure, I assure you. Oh, yeah. And I think that's what happened. And basically, Turner agreed and made an announcement. No more hearings in the House. That means the next hearing has to be in the Senate. Okay. I think it's been in, uh, pending for some time. But again, I marvel at how the river of history has been has been so challenging for our little boat. It has been brutal. Uh, I mean, you can go back all the way to 47 and just see the things that happened that prevented truth from getting out. Right. Uh, if if Truman or his his top people do not get to Ramey fast enough, if they don't get that press conference out the same day in the later in the evening, reversing the press release that went out from the Army Air Force Base, uh, there would have been reporters all over Roswell interviewing people. Lots of people. Yeah. And it would have been over. It would have been done. We would have had disclosure in July of 1947. He was just able to get it there in time. They had to get the records in. They had to get uh, Marcel in. They had to hold the thing. They had to hold up the, the nonsense stuff and call it a weather balloon, whatever. They had to get all that done. They had a limited amount of time. Uh, and all of this is covered in Don Schmidt and, and Thomas Carey's absolute masterpiece, The Witness to Roswell and the subsequent update. Uh, so this didn't happen, right? 52 had another shot. It could have easily happened then, uh, but a, a more strangely is the modern era where after years of of some progress, Stephen Greer makes a significant breakthrough because he had the money and the commitment, uh, and he's able to get a major press conference at the, at the National Press Club in the building I'm in. It's upstairs. Oh, wow. uh, I'm in the Na National Press building right now. He, he, he has done all this work, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. He's interviewed all these witnesses on tape. He brings 15 into the into the ballroom, a tape covering another, I don't know, 67, hands those to the press. They all give testimony and and and, and confirm they would give the same testimony under oath. It's a very significant event. I was there. Packed. The press was interested. There's no question. We got we got indications afterward. There was definite interest in the press to look at these. And this was, I thought, the beginning of the end. May 9th, 2001. Well, we all know what happened four months later, don't we? Yeah. 911. An absolute catastrophe. So that shelved it. And then we're trying to bring things back. I'm sure Stephen Greer was doing what he could do. I was much less resources, but I came up with an idea. I, I decided to, I could run for Congress in the 8th District of Maryland, which is right next to Washington, D.C., as an independent candidate talking about the ET issue, right? In front of cameras and in debates and stuff, which would be really cool, draw a lot of attention to the issue. It's right there and the race included a Kennedy, uh, Mark Shriver, which was attracting even more press. And I, I did, I got, I don't know, 5,000 signatures that summer of 2002. One of the hottest summers on record. I mean, literally we were dying out there uh, gathering signatures. And so I did that. 
okay? Uh, 2003 comes along and what happened? George Bush decides what he needs to do is launch a war into Iraq based upon a lie in order to show that he's just as good a war president as his daddy was. And literally triggers a catastrophe that we're still living with today. And that starts in 2003. So that shelved that move. All right. And God, there's been others, but just recently, all right, the To the Stars Academy comes out in 2007, uh, two, comes together in 2015, 16. That's when the whole thing was coming together. There was They were forming it and making their plans and so forth, using uh, Tom DeLong money to, to get things put together. He had it and he was leading the group and that's fine. He was always been interested in the subject. And it was all predicated on Hillary Clinton winning the election. And she was a heavy favorite. And then she lost. And the way she lost was almost hard to imagine. And, I, and this is why I, I missed one. When the, when, the, when the Clintons are finishing up the two terms, mm. the Rockefeller Initiative was shut down uh, in October of, uh, of uh, 96 because he was going to run again. He'd been stonewalled by the Air Force and stonewalled by the Department, his own Department of Defense and Air Force, and they lied to him and whatever. It was clear he wasn't going to get anything. Not that it could have, that the, the disclosure could happen that way. It's not going to happen that way. It would take an extraordinary uh, action on the part of a president to force majeure disclosure out of a DOD. It could be done, but political damage would have been huge. But nevertheless, he was trying to get the information, which certainly bothered them a great deal. And so they pushed back really hard and uh, caused some problems for the administration. Ultimately, the Air Force spent millions of dollars on a phony report. And then he's running for president. So they basically, they shut it down. In other words, given up. Well, at least I think that's what they were doing. I think it was. And so he had to run for election. Stephanopoulos stepped out of the campaign uh, for various reasons, left. And he runs for election and wins. And now he is the post-disclosure, I'm sorry, he is not the post -disclosure. Now he is a lame duck second term president, mad as hell over the fact that government's completely stonewalled him on this issue and could do anything he wants because he's never going to run again. And wow, that I think they were very concerned. Of course, the, the fact is he, he probably knew his wife was, wife was going to run again, but still, uh, that I think that had the powers to be very concerned because he just might come back on this issue again. And if he did, he would have nothing to lose. And so even though he was a lame duck president, they decided we're going to stay on this guy. We're going to get him. We're going to get him. We're going to get him. They had tried everything in the first term. They hit him with everything they could. Most of it was bogus. Some of it was le legitimate. Was it enough to get rid of him? No. But they kept trying and they came up and I say they didn't manufacture, they found Monica Lewinsky. Yeah. And that's how they locked him up uh, and impeached him, though they failed, but certainly eliminated any chance that he would renew his uh, his efforts on the U UFO issue. But his wife was another matter. So the next election is coming up. And who's running? His vice president, Al Gore. Did Al Gore know that, that this whole Rockefeller initiative effort to get the UFO files was going on in the White House for three years? Yeah, he knew. Of course he did. He was a very respected senator, liked by the Department of Defense and so forth, and very much could have engaged the issue with a far different outcome than Clinton, who was despised by the military in the Department of Defense. And of course, because he was Clinton's vice president, the legacy of the disclosure process and its outcome would have kind of, you know, splashed back on them, but also they could have been involved. He's a Democratic president, former vice president under Bill Clinton. The idea that they might be involved in an effort by Gore to end the truth in Barbara would have been totally appropriate. Gore lost the election by one vote. One of the most bizarre elections in American history. Utterly amazing. And I watched it every single day. He lost by one vote. 
And that, of course, was the Supreme Court 5-4 decision regarding Florida. And so the Clintons are now out completely until Hillary can run herself. And so that happened. And the, what are the odds of an election that close that ends up being decided in the Supreme Court? They're staggering. And so that cuts the process off again. And then as we get down the line, so finally, the, the, the who the stars people come out anyway in 2017. They, they decide to take a chance. God knows. God bless them. And start moving the ball forward. And they're making progress. They are. Mellon, Elizondo, and, and Gary Nolan kind of split off. And they're doing their thing. Podcast, education, and Mellon is doing the political stuff and creating the briefings and putting them together. Yeah. They're making a lot of progress. And things are looking very favorable. And then the only thing that happened was the biggest pandemic since 2017, uh, 1917. That's all. Just yeah. that. Just okay. that small thing, you know, change thing. the world. Okay. It's fine. So that happens. So that delays everything. And then, and of course, the political situation was extremely odd. That was almost one of a kind. That was going on as well. The pandemic, though, made it even worse. And so, and so as we move to a new president's presidential change, okay, that opens possibly the door a little more, uh, We've had legislation. The first legislation ever on this issue has taken place and been signed in December of 2020. We're very excited about that. Looks really good, very favorable. What happens next? The first attack on the White House since the war of 1812. Just that. I watched it happen because it was happening five blocks away from my office. Uh, insurrection. That's that. Okay. And then we continue the guys that are behind this, you know, including my colleague, uh, Danny Sheehan, continued to, to move forward, continued to move this issue forward, which they did. They're making progress. We have legislation signed in uh, December of 2021. Right. And we're feeling good about that. We go into 2022. And what happens? Just the first major war in Europe since World War II. Not only that, but a war of a certain type that may be the most, the greatest risk to create a nuclear war we've seen, even worse than than the, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Just that, okay. And I'm thinking, what? What do we got to do? Are we cursed? It's like the Greek gods playing with us, meaning hey, you, whatever you're going to do, we're going to come down with our giant Greek god hands and screw it up. And so we have that. We overcome that. We move forward. Right? We've, we've still got time to, to have the hearings in the Senate before the campaigns get underway. People have been briefed. Witnesses are ready to go. Congress is saturated with information, at least the appropriate committees. We've had the fourth piece of legislation has been up on the Senate site for months. It's it's the best ever. In fact, it's the the the, 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 the all the rest they needed. It's the now the total legislative structure once this is passed is all they needed to set up for post disclosure. That's what this is all about. Yeah. They're setting up all the structure for after the president discloses, and feeling pretty good. And then what happens? An event about as horrible as I've ever seen in my lifetime. And I'm not taking sides here. I'm just saying it was a horrible event that is going to set major parts of the world on fire. That's a catastrophe. It's going to absorb our interest and it's going to create problems for everybody for months. I, again, when I when I look back at the history of this, I simply marvel at the timing of things, the unlikelihood of things that have happened that have kept this movement from happening. The I Indian independence movement really had one major thing happened that, that prevented the process from going forward. They were moving along pretty well. And then World War II started. Yeah. And they knew that there's no way they could continue 
to protest against the British occupation while the British were fighting the Nazis. And so they basically had to stand down for four years. Now, bad luck? Well, maybe, but still, I get that. What's happening with us is just, I can't, it's just, it's just bizarre. Uh, and so the message is, you know, look, the world is not getting less complex. It's getting more complex. The dangers are not getting less. They're getting greater. And so I understand it's difficult, Mark Warner. I understand it's difficult, President Biden. Get it done. Just get it done. All right. Hold the hearing. Bring in the nuclear witnesses. Bring in Grush. Bring in the un, uh, uh, unacknowledged special access program people that talk to Grush, that confirm the bodies and the crash vehicles. Line them up for a week. Interview them under oath. Get all of this out to the hundreds of millions of people watching so the president can confirm the ET presence and we can enter the post-disclosure world. Then whatever bizarre nonsense happens after that, Yellowstone explodes, you get hit <laughs> by a meteorite. I don't know. The big one finally happens in California and Los Angeles slides into the ocean. At least it's in the post-disclosure world. And we have something to look forward to and something that, and, and maybe a, a ways to deal with our problems. That's how I put this in context. Yeah. And and uh, I don't want to complain too much because I know a lot about the uh, other activist movements of the 20th century. Let me tell you, they were deadly and they were awful. The labor movement of the earliest 20th century, they were getting killed and beaten to death all the time. The black leaders were being shot, uh, hung, whatever. So I got to be careful about how much I complain because it's nothing like that in this movement. Uh, ridicule is not the same thing as being hung from a tree. I get that. But the issue is so important. The implication is so profound and so global that it is particularly frustrating when these amazing events keep taking place that prevent us from just getting this done. Do, do you think, based on that, though, you don't think it's going to get put back in the box again? It's just going to get delayed? Because at this point, there isn't really any putting it back. Well... Yeah, in, in 1969, they put it back in the box. They played it carefully. They played their cards. They held Blue Book for a while, and yep. looked at a lot of sightings, just came to bogus conclusions and showed what seemed to be a study. And so, okay, so the people said, hold on, you studied it. Then they, they got Condon to, to disgrace himself in the University of Colorado and come up with a completely bogus uh, report that they used then to shut Blue Book down. Uh, you had members of the CIA, known members, they were known, uh, on the board of directors of NICAP, the most important organization at the time. And there were a lot of scientists, and there was NICAP was very legit, not, not only legitimate, but sophisticated. And it was all, you know, pretty much, you know, everybody together, kumbaya. So they had some CIA people on the board. They were fine with that until it was time to shut it down. And then the board took over, threw Keo out shut down all of the regional facilities and spend all the money on themselves. That's what happened in 69. Yeah. Here's where we are now. Four years of extraordinary legislation, which, which I can get into if you want. I, we, I've got the, 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 the bill right, right, right up on my screen. Uh, four years of legislation creating all of the infrastructure necessary to bring the information about what the government has and knows about ETs properly out into the arena, into the National Archives and so forth. Four years of legislation, they set up a complete office at the DOD, got the NASA to you know, start their own investigation, right? And more, this is not 1969 and you can't put that back in the can. It's done, it's over. The only thing that could prevent disclosure for any significant length of time would be a nuclear event in uh, Ukraine. Somebody launches yeah. a tactical nuke. I'm not going to tell you where I'm going to be, but it won't be in this office. I can assure you. <laughs> so, South America, somewhere I don't know, far um, away. Uh, but that's the only thing, really. Uh, you know, if 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 there's going to be some terrorism uh, over the next weeks, months, there's going to be some terrorism all, around the world. The events uh, that have just happened have basically handed a a, a, a pass, or not a pass, but a card to every every group in the world. 
that if you want to do something, do it. And they're going to. I'm not I'm not picking any sides here. I'm just stating a fact. That's what they're going to do. That's going to be extremely consuming of the press and the politics. We'll see how that goes. Uh, it will be more delay. But the message that I keep giving out on every podcast that I do, because you know, all my requests to come and meet with the Senate Intel Committee are just, I'm not getting anything back from them, uh, is this, that this next election is going to be an important election. And it has the potential to be one of the most absurd elections in history. I mean, literally off the charts, crazy. And the American people are fed up with crazy. And they need, they need some substantive process uh, to consider as they vote for the the next group of 435 members of Congress, 33 senators, and 50 governors. And David Grush, among others, has now hung this issue literally over everybody's head. Grush has said in an interview, both on television and in print, and under oath before a committee that we have non-human bodies and non-human technology. And we know what that means. He said it in other interviews. The government hasn't denied it. Uh, and in fact, when you, when you, when, if you read the legislation that I just referred to, the Senate 2022, 20, 20, 20, 22, bill, the term Unidentified anomalous phenomena is in the bill 141 times. The name of the bill is the UAP Disclosure Act. The, the, the phrase non-human is in there a lot. I need to check it. In fact, I can do that now. I don't know, maybe in there 40, 50, 70 times. Okay, this thing is out there. And yeah. so if they, if they don't hold the hearings as soon as possible, the real ones, the ones that are going to end this thing, this embargo. And they, so the president can confirm it. All these 2,000 people, and I mean it, 2,000 people that are running for all these offices are going to have this thing hanging of them, above them, unresolved, in, in midair, and they're going to be asked questions about it, and they have no idea what to say. They're going to all make fools of themselves, Right? Uh, tell me, uh, candidate so-and-so, uh, do you really believe that we have non-human bodies somewhere in underground facilities? Uh, I, I, um, is this going to be nothing? It's going to be just a fiasco. As opposed to, if confirmation comes from the president, say, soon, the next couple of months, certainly before the primary start, then every single person that is running and who wins election next year, the American people will know what they think about the fact that we're not alone. The fact that we had a truth embargo. The fact that we have re-engineered technologies. They're going to know what they think about it. And if their answer to those questions is, I don't care about that, or I, I had no idea because I've been living in a cave, but I'd still like to be your senator or whatever the hell. And fine, they'll have those answers. And those people will be elected with that aspect of who they are and what they want. And we'll get a Congress and governors and a president too, I should imagine. I mean, obviously, in 2025 that has a stated understanding position about the most important matter in human history. Or we can have 12 months of monkey business, nonsense, clown car uh, uh, campaigning. Uh, it's that simple. I don't know, overstated, but that it, that's what it comes down to. That is what is in Senator Warner's hands right now. He can literally turn this campaign into a massive referendum on how we're going to deal with this issue, the kind of people leaders we select to deal with this issue in the post-disclosure world, I mean, deal with the post-disclosure world, or simply have a campaign where everybody's running around knowing, no, not knowing what to say. The whole issue is kind of um, just being made of, being made ridiculous. Everybody looks stupid, including the, you know, even the people that are not running, the, 
you know, there's 60 some senators that will not be running. I mean, it's just bad for everybody. That is now in the hands of Senator Warner. The president of the United States cannot stop Senator Warner from holding this hearing. Can't. Three branches of government can't do it. Okay. The DOD can't stop him. He can do it anytime he wants. And so he has to make that decision. And God, what would I give to just sit down for a half an hour with that gentleman and just discuss this and give a point of view from the citizen perspective of why he needs to make one decision as opposed to the other. But again, activists are generally not on the RS, you know, not asked for RSVPs. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Here, okay, I, was I think the gentleman yeah. below here deserves yes. a question. He's been, he's he been needs to ask a question. He has two more whiskeys and, and uh, starts uh, s singing old anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts? I've just been uh, engrossed in this in your in your insights here. Um, On the, the NDAA, the Senate bill, is that what we're just, talking about? Well, just, no, I mean, I mean, just. Oh, just long. insights in general. Yeah, he was talking. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was looking at the I've read this, um, the UAPDA um, NHI comes up about like 24, 25 times like mm -hmm. um. I think just the fact that it is physically written into it, you know, that's something I try to talk about with people in my life. I'm like, this is actual, this is happening. Yeah. And the reactions are obviously all different. So my, my question is what are, I know Persephone asked about ways like activists can get involved and, in, and, in, nor and non-activists can get involved, but what, what are some, ways to get people more engrossed in the topic less apathetic yeah like to show them like hey this is happening like i think you should start paying attention to this actually that's not really a concern at this point uh one the awareness of the issue is massive uh the idea of extraterrestrials thanks to hollywood is absolutely common knowledge uh, the uh, concept, rather. Uh, in terms of the awareness of the process, the disclosure process underway and its proximity to success, uh, the media is covering it. There's no question. The media is covering it extensively around the world. As I say, this year will be the most articles that I've ever curated. It's going to almost get to 2,000. I think the highest before was like 1,100. Uh, and I'm actually curating tougher than I did back then. And every, everybody's in the Washington Post, New York Times, MB, ABC, NBC, CBS News, MSNBC, Fox, all of them, and and, and other papers, right? Uh, so there's plenty of coverage. So it's out there. It's not, it, it gets, it doesn't give the interview space that it should get. It's gotten some good stuff. News Nation is, is definitely doing a lot of interview time, but News Nation is still small, but growing. It's going to be a major entity, trust me. It's got big money behind it and a mission. Uh, Fox is, has had some significant interviews, ironically enough, and whenever they do have an interview on the subject, uh, it always goes very well. I don't care who the interviewer is. They just conduct themselves like real journalists because it's a nonpartisan issue. In other words, we learn for that moment, there's a real journalist in that person, and then they go back to their other stuff. But So they've done a lot. CBS, NBC, no, no, they have not done enough interview time. Uh, uh, I have, I've only been asked to be on ABC once in 26 years. Oh, wait. Yeah, actually, I've been I, back in the early aughts. I, I did some, I did some CNN, I did some NBC, that kind of stuff. But then I fell off their Rolodex for various reasons, and, and I haven't been back in quite a while. I'm working on it. Uh, Nick Pope has gotten some a lot of interviews, uh, probably more than almost anyone else. Richard is Richard Dolan's gotten some, but overall, uh, it's 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 limited there. And so, but. The awareness of this process is pretty substantial. We don't need the entire country uh, thinking there's going to be a hearing next month. The number of people that are that are expecting it know the process is, an, is a substantial number. It's in the many, 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 many millions. That's all you need to get the job done. Uh, and so, I mean, this is this is not a referendum thing. Like, let's let's have a referendum and see if the majority of the American people think we ought to disclose. No, no. Same thing with going to war and so forth. They don't take a referendum. They just say, we're going to war. <laughs> um, 
so I wouldn't worry about that. I think I think that there are now two million podcasts, something like between two and five million podcasts in in the world today, uh, and they are the the total amount of information that is coming out of these podcasts is massive. It hasn't been fully measured, but it's unbelievable. It's a giant vast, vast fire hose. Uh, everybody's interviewing everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, so believe me, there's plenty. And and I've, I've done hundreds of podcasts. And so the information's out there. People got it. Uh, but they have their lives. They're not going to just you know, sign up. If we had the kind of funding that would allow us to generate more substantial brick and mortar operations, we could do some more things. Danny Sheehan finally launched his new Paradigm Institute. And he's finally got some initial funding. He's been working on that for years and years. He finally got it, but he earned it, deserved it. So he already has opened his Washington office of the New Paradigm Institute, which is the think tank, nonprofit. That's down the street near the Capitol. Uh, and uh, I think it's across the street from the Intel Senate, the Intel C Committee staff offices, which I think is pretty cool, Senate, uh, and probably intentional. And my office is up here. You know, in the national press building, but he's he's got funding. He's also going to have a Los Angeles presence. This is going to be a multi multi million dollar think tank. That's that's coming together. But again, this is what seventy six years after Roswell, we for, we get the first solid, heavily funded think tank on this issue, and that's what it is. It's all about the post disclosure world, right? It's not about proving the ET presence. I can assure you, that's seventy six years. You finally get that. So the, one of the ways the truth embargo succeeded and without getting into the the details is simply make it very unlikely that people with substantial resources will put them into this subject no grants no major funds uh no brick and mortar operations in other words you want to you want to take us on fine take us on out of your own paycheck right you know, mortgage your house, sell your second car, whatever, and do your worst. But you're not going to get any big money from the big guys. And we haven't. With very few exceptions. There have been a couple of notable exceptions. But the funding of this activist movement, which basically goes back to 48, 9 and, 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 and Keo, but very limited, but then starts to pick up and grow. Probably it's the least funded uh, activist movement in all of history uh, uh, concerning an issue of great, great importance. It's hard to imagine a less funded, it's just no money. Now that's changing, I assure you, that is changing and it's going to be much different. Uh, I expect funding for PRG and other things and there's other projects out there. Uh, it, right now, almost every studio in, in LA has got one or two UAP projects in the works. They finally caught on, that's part of my work. I have an announcement regarding Hollywood and I will say LA that's gonna come out first of November, kind of a cool deal. Okay. Uh, all of this is, again, things that could have been around in, in, in you know, 20, 30 years ago, but the truth embargo prevented. The truth embargo is not has not been pursued with vigor for some time. It just really isn't. They're really not doing for some time now any putting any energy into it or coming up with any clever tricks. Though people who are deeply suspicious of government and, and are not prepared to believe anything they say uh, see all kinds of things that really aren't happening in my view. They're just not supporting it anymore. Do you they think, haven't ended it, but they're not supporting it. Do you think in part that's because also like in a way there is a younger blood influx to these programs. So there's, you know, millennials like me, Gen Z, like Anton, it's like there's there's younger people now working and coming into this who are like, I don't want to do this anymore. Why are we doing this? Why don't we just put it out there? Like, you know? Sure. They, they, they don't... Uh... The young people today are simply not accepting these kinds of policies yeah. uh, and are just it's, it's, it's harder it's harder and harder to convince each successive generation to go along with this thing. The baby boomers they locked up pretty quickly and I'm a baby boomer, but I didn't pay attention and so they never really locked me up when it was time to get involved I got involved. but the millennials all oh, they just they have less patience for this kind of nonsense oh yeah. Uh, I have they none, don't, and they don't. They don't know the history and and so forth, and try, try to sell them on the Cold War stuff. And no, and so and then and then of course they're the masters of tech, right? So you've got you've got these young people, the masters of tech. You've got a bunch of old farts, you know, in, in D.C. who still don't know how to use a, 
you know, uh, TikTok or whatever the hell, and they're 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 trying to keep the truth and bargain together. It's it's a failed enterprise, so it's going to end. Yeah. You know what? It's going to end, and everything that's been done since 2017 uh, has all been about how to end it, not how to solve improve the ET presence. I mean, they they all they've always known about the ET issue, and and the reason they're going through all of this stuff and doing all this legislation and setting up the the the, the groups and the task force which is tricky and awkward because they already know what it is that we're dealing with, but they're having to set up all of this stuff as if they don't. And so that is basically another lie. And one of the reasons that I discussed this at length over and over again is because I know they're lying, but they're lying to good purpose. In other words, they got to get out from under this thing. And in order to do that, they got to set this stuff up and they're going to have to be, they're not going to be able to represent the truth. They're going to have to play games with the truth in order to do it, but it's to good purpose. And so I, I'm basically spilling the beans. Why am I doing that? Because I don't have to, but because I know full well that plenty of people are very irritated by this because they know that they're still not being truthful and it irritates them. They know too much about the history. And what I, the message I'm trying to say is, look, I get it. This is an unusual situation. They're trying to get out from a 75-year history of lying on one of the most important issue in the world. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, implications for all kinds of people and institutions and everything else. And they're trying to do it in a way that is constructive and not disruptive and will make them look as good as possible. Take some of the pain away. It's a public relations process. Yeah. Is what it is. And, but, for, but to the extent that people know that, Meaning, yeah, you're lying, but I know why you're lying, and it's going to a place that we need to go. It makes it more authentic. In other words, at the end, to the extent that people get what I'm trying to say, they won't feel like they got bamboozled again. And if you lied to us again, okay, yeah, you told the truth for me, but yeah, no, you, no, they'll, they'll know. Yeah, there's a reason why they're having to misrepresent this still, and they're playing this game, and it is to be able to get the damn thing done. And so it makes it more authentic, and I think it will improve the ability of the government to reclaim confidence of people. So I'm asking them to hold two thoughts in their mind at the same time. One, that they're trying to get in the truth embargo and get the truth out. And two, they're having to lie about a lot of things and misrepresent a lot of things as they do that. All right. Uh, but there is uh, one very significant uh, other point, which is equally important, maybe more. And it's a simple thing. Imagine that somehow the president of the United States got some briefings behind the scenes, talked to a couple of witnesses, and realized, oh, my God, there's an ET presence here. Oh, there's some pro – they got programs and all this stuff, and simply decides, got to got to do it, and suddenly comes out and gives an announcement and says, there's, there's ETs here. Disclosure has happened. Boom. But no legislation has been passed. No program – no, no office is set up at the DOD. Nothing is set up at NASA. Right. Nobody's had a chance to, 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 to be part of some sort of truth process. It's just slammed down. And now they got to go and set all that stuff up. They got to set up arrow. They got to hold hearings they gotta, in the chaos of the world learning from the heads of state. Yeah, you were not alone. It, it would be ridiculous. It would be a mess. So compare that to what's happening. All this is done. All the structure is there. The president comes out finally and announces it in the East Room of the White House, and the post-disclosure world begins. And guess what? Every single thing they have done, every law that they've passed, all the legislation, the creation of Arrow, the study, the study program and panel set up at the at the at the at, 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 at the uh, NASA, everything they have done now is absolutely necessary, and it's already in place. And so the day after disclosure. People will say, well, well, uh, well, when are we going to get information? Well, as you know, under the legislation that was passed you know, last year or whatever, uh, that's going to be brought out and it's going to be uh, examined by a committee uh, that is uh, appointed to the president. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have some laws protecting people that are coming forward with information and, and uh, we're going to be moving into the archives and blah, blah, blah. They all say that because it's all set up to do that. And so this is a dual thing. It's a public relations extrication project to make them look better, but it is a, a preparation project for what they know they're going to face 
the day after the president finally confirms and have it all ready. And the only thing that's made it awkward is what I talked about earlier, is that circumstances in the world have drawn this out. This could have been done way sooner and way quicker, in which case it would have been less awkward. But it has been stretched out, and that's just the way it is. And so I'm very under. I mean, I'm 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 really giving a lot of slack, and I, I get yeah. it. I get it. Uh, and I want people to be generous, and I want people to praise them. Uh, that will help to ensure that it happens. Yeah, I like that. We'll definitely be doing that. Uh, do you have a question, Anton? Really? I only had I had one more. Um, mm -hmm. Just very quickly, just for my curiosity's sake, what spurred you to get involved in this as passionately as you are? Yep, that's a good one. Yeah, I'm asked that a lot. I've got several ways I can answer that. So I'm <laughs> in the mood to, to give you the personal answer. Okay, you ready? Okay. Lay it on me. I really didn't do much with the first half of my life. I wasted my talents, my skills, and whatever. Nothing unusual about that. That is, in fact, a lot of most people. Uh, and it was very, very unhappy. But over a stretch of three years, starting in 1992, some things happened that made it possible for me to just walk away from everything, though there wasn't much to walk away from, jump into this issue, go to Washington, move into a family home, set up in the attic, and, and start being an activist on this issue. And the three things that happened were this. I marched in some civil rights marches. I marched in some anti-war marches and stuff. And, you know, I was always, I was on the periphery. I had plenty of political opinions, but I, I just wasn't together. I could have joined any number of organizations, anti-war or, or uh, 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 anti-segregation, what have you, civil rights. I didn't do it. I just sat in the sideline. In 1992, after the Vietnam War, which really is one of the most important things in my life, I mean, it affected me in probably more than anything up until very recently. Uh, it just it just upset my whole worldview. Uh, it was just awful. And so after, you know, when the, I would not go see any movie about uh, the Vietnam War. And they kept coming out and coming out. I would not go. I would not go. Eventually, I did watch them. But it was many, many years later. And as of 1992, I'd never visited the, the, the Vietnam War Memorial. I knew how powerful it was. I had read plenty about it, but I'd never gone there. Finally, in 92, I was in Washington. I had a job. It was just a job going out there every day. Still not much happening, but I get, get a little bit of money. But So I went down. I went down to the Vietnam War Memorial. And I did what everybody does. I, I walked the length of it and looked at the wall and these sorts of descriptions. There's some, there's some sculpting down there that was added later, which is pretty powerful, pretty cool stuff. And then I did what a lot of people do. I went to the book, the book that has the names that tells you exactly where that person's name is on the wall. And I'm sure I'm not the only one to ever do this, but it depends on your name. But I was curious if another Bassett had died in Vietnam was on that wall. Now, if my name was Tom Jones, that would have been a ridiculous thing to do. But my name is Bassett. It's an unusual name. So I I, I opened uh, up the book and I went down there. And lo and behold, there was one. That was Bassett. So I went over to the wall. I found it. Right? And then I went back to the bench. And I started to get really upset. And I don't get upset easy. And it, well, what's going on here? What's going on here? And it just, I had this feeling. It's, it's a feeling. It's not a logical, rational thing. That Douglas Bassett had gone there in my place. He said, I, I was born in 46. I was drafted twice. I was physical twice. But there was no way in hell I was going to go to Vietnam. And I didn't. But he did. And so I'm sitting there and I'm going, no. 
And so I, I did something that a lot of people do. I had, in those days, I carried around, this was again, 92. I carried around what's called a black police. It has a notepad in it that I always put notes and stuff, right? Uh, I actually still have that notepad, but interestingly enough, I never use it. And so I took it out and I wrote a letter to Douglas Bassett. And that letter, and I, you know, when I finished, I put a rock on top of it and put it in front of his name, plaque. And that letter that day would have been put into the archive. It's in the archive to this day. Everything that's laid down there goes in the archive. It would be interesting to go and read it again. I don't think it's possible, but I, but, and I don't remember that much, except I remember the last part. Essentially, in the last part of this letter, it wasn't long. Basically, what I said in so many words was, I've had a number of opportunities to get involved with an issue, an activist issue to change, to to make the world better. And I've always just, just dabbled. The next opportunity I have, I'm going to go in 100%. And I put that down. Okay. Fine. Words, nothing more than words. The second thing that happened, and this is pretty cool, is that later in 92, for after six attempts, I think, of applying to the Hawaii Ironman Triathlon, which they still do it, I believe. And back then, the Hawaii Triathlon was the championship was huge. It was a big deal. It was on TV and it was like huge. And they allowed a hundred or so people to simply apply as a lottery picks and you paid a fee and if you got picked out of the thousands of applicants then that fee went towards your entry and you're in and it doesn't matter who you are you're in if you want to come and try it give it a shot i tried six times and the sixth time i got a letter said you're in it was may i think i was a 5k runner 10k 5k 10k runner so I bet but I had not done any swimming in years. So I had May, June, July, August, September, October. I had about six months to train myself to a point where I could finish the Ironman triathlon. It required total organization, commitment, and everything else, right, that I wasn't doing in my life. And so, but I was so motivated. And so I put out a plan. I, you know, I changed my ED, all this kind of stuff. And I, and I trained for six months to do nothing more than finish it. Flew out to Hawaii. Got up one morning, 6.30, went down and started the Hawaii Triathlon. I swam uh, two, two and a half mi 2.4 miles, 2.2 miles, open water, never done that before. It was okay. It was, I trained in a swimming pool, but I, you know, I'd always swum some. I finished. More importantly, I finished in time. Because you see, the way they do this is if you don't finish in a certain time, say the swimming, you're out. Because they don't want anybody dying in the middle of the triathlon. And so these lottery pick, I mean, you could show up, you know, 80 pounds of weight, whatever, you're in, but they're not going to let you die. So I had to, I, mean, I finished in time. I felt fantastic. I got on the bike, took off, 112 mile bike ride. Uh, the weather happened to be really good that year, but it was tough. Going out was fantastic. The wind was behind me. I'm blasting away on a bike. The wind's behind me, and I'm realizing I'm going to do this, and I've never felt better in my life. Then we had to turn around and come back into the wind. And so by the time I finished the bike, I was, you know, but I got my shoes on, and off I go to do the to the marathon. Tragically uh, and idiotically, uh, in the couple of days leading up to when I was in Hawaii getting ready, I'm I'm cruising around, having a good time, and you know, in Hawaii, it's great. And I've got flip-flops that I brought with me. I rarely ever wear flip-flops, but I had flip-flops and I'm walking around and these things are irritating my toes down beneath, you know, the way they cut between the two toes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I hate that. And I started a blister I didn't know about. And so about eight miles into the marathon, these things exploded across my front of my feet and I'm going, oh my, and I was in some of the worst pain I've ever been. So for most of the marathon, I had to walk my way in to finish this thing. And what I mean by that is if you had to finish by midnight or you got no medal and you were not listed as a finisher. And so that was simply not acceptable. And so I plowed through the pain and I finished about 30 minutes before midnight, went to the medical tent and passed out. Okay. So 
I get back to the U.S. But that act of doing that, of focus, of, of perseverance, of structure, was what had been missing from my life, virtually, going back to childhood. And I just did it. Okay. That was number two. I continued to try to get some work and do various. I end up in California and I'm in San Luis Obispo doing some business consulting stuff. Actually got a CEO temp job, but the owner was insane. He was insane and, and he was doing things that was off the charts. And I was at a meeting and, and with all the employees and he was doing a, I don't know, it's hard to describe it. I just got to quit, walk away. Uh, and so at that point, I'm really at the end in a way. And then the third thing that happened was this. I had a computer by that point. It was a gateway. It cost 3,000 bucks. <laughs> and I'm actually browsing, you know, with the Net Netscape. Right? And I'm, I'm, I'm again, I'm, it's new, but it's it's a computer. And I'm, and I'm cruising around. You can look, think, look up things. And so I happened to come across articles about Zoloft. SSRI, serotonin mm -hmm. selective reuptake inhibitors. And I read about how they work and who benefits. And I realized I was literally the poster boy for that drug. So I went down to the clinic, free clinic, and ultimately they put me to a doctor and I went on Zoloft at the age of 49. In 10 days, I was a completely different person. I wish Zoloft had turned up 20 years sooner. I might have ended up with a PhD in astrophysics and be running NASA. Who the hell knows? But 10 days, I was a completely different person. That was the third thing. And from there, I started making decisions and started thinking in different ways. And based upon some books I'd read, particularly John Mack's book, I made the decision, okay, I'm going to be an activist. I'm going to follow through with the letter that I gave to, uh, sent to, uh, to Douglas Bassett. And this is going to be it. And so I just... Went east, volunteered for four months, and then went to D.C., set up, registered a lobbyist, knowing that the Washington Post would eventually find that lobbying registration and want to know who the hell was crazy enough to, to, to register as a UFO lobbyist, right? Though I didn't use the term UFO. I don't like that term. And they'd come and see me, and they did. They came out, they interviewed me, put a huge article up on the front page of the business section, and that's what I needed to launch my career. That's how it happened. Wow. That's cool. That's I only told story. the story about three times, I think, but tonight felt good for it. Tonight was a good night for it. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Wow. And I never regretted it. As, as hard as it's been and, and not having money and other stuff, I've never regretted it. Uh, I've had I'd had jobs in the past where every every minute was like excruciating. <laughs> no problem. Oh, me too. Well, Oh death. yeah, not this. Yeah, uh, I'm so I I feel it's an incredible gift. I wish it hadn't taken so long, but it, but fortunately, all that exercise I used to get before I entered this field, all the marathons, all the running, the weightlifting, everything else. Plus, I was a tennis player, pro, a semi-pro tennis wow. player. It bought me, it bought me some years, so that I'm going to actually see this through. If I hadn't done those things, which didn't make me any money, uh, I wouldn't have had this time. So once again, I'm fortunate. Wow. Uh, look, I do, and I, I should have done this. I mean, I sent out to my list. I put it up on Twitter and Facebook and everything else. Look, I'm going to, when we get done, I'm going to go to my website and I'm going to put this link right up on the top page, highlight it real big time. And it's, again, it's a simple thing. It's a PDF file uh, in which I've taken all the language of the 2226 bill and put it into nice standard you know, text. And then I've highlighted the areas I find interesting, and I'm changing it. And, and, and I may add some more, take some more. So the highlights may change, and I'll just reload them. So it's actually going to may, may change over time. Right. But you can read that bill. That's the easiest way to read it. It's right there. Uh, and so I'll put that link up. It's going to be paradigmresearchgroup.org slash 2024 hyphen NDAA hyphen Senate dot EDF. Anyway, uh, I'll have that link up, and people can check it out. But we've already talked about it quite a bit. It's extraordinary, as uh, and yeah. as mentioned, 
uh, it's got 20 some references to non-human. It's got 140 references to, you know, unidentified anomalous phenomena. By the way, language is so critical to activism and good language leads to good outcomes. And that's true on both sides, the, the public side and the government side. So UFO became UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena. We wanted that because we knew that, that we, there was too many people that did not want UFO to ever come out of their mouth because they know what that means, right? So the, we gave them a, an ultra, better alternative. You can say UAP. And they go, oh, okay, we'll do that. And guess what? That's what was used in the early bills. UAP, UAP, no UFO. Uh, and so that language helped that, all right? But after they set up uh, the uh, UAP task force over at Office of Naval Intelligence that uh, David Grush was working at when he started getting those phone calls, legitimate phone calls, uh, they quickly, to the, some, I'm sure some people may have known this, but some of the people that are were looking into this, certainly over at the Senate offices and what have you, learned that there's been plenty of reports of undersea activity where something cruises by at 150 miles an hour, which is pretty fast for a submarine. We call them unidentified uh, submerged objects, USOs. And they realized that these are almost certainly the same thing, right? They're, they're ET craft. And so they needed to expand. They're not aerial, so they had to expand it. And so they decided to go an, uh, unidentified anomalous phenomena. It wasn't that they didn't it, that they didn't like unidentified aerial phenomena, but it did not cover the issue properly. Right. And we're talking now legislation and stuff. We have to be precise, right? You've got to be it right. So they switched into that. Right. Unidentified anomalous phenomena. Uh, and that was that was significant. And then uh they they went through several more name changes that just didn't fit, but they were trying to make them fit and they were absurd. And they finally landed on arrow. And the reason they, I think the arrow stuck is that one, it's the right phrase, unidentified anomalous phenomena resolution office and a lot of people forget about the resolution office okay they literally put in the name of the organization the word resolution which means what are they resolving right oh is it they're just resolving each case right it comes along we'll resolve that case now nah, they already know the damn things are here what are they resolving they're resolving the truth in barco they're going to resolve the truth embargo. So it's a, re a re resolution office. And then it has a XOR acronym. Arrow. You got to love it, right? Sort of like UFO, but no. Okay? So that's that stuck, and that will continue to stick. All right? So this this language is, uh, is, is important. Um, okay, all right. So anyway, that that is... That is a, a sense. It gives you a little sense of yeah of how these things have evolved, and that evolution, where they're trying to get the right language to fit the subject, and also to be appropriate and satisfying to the public, is excellent confirmation of their intent. Yeah, if your intent is to screw around with this issue and try to get away with something again, you you don't try to get precise language. You don't try to tailor the language to what is known about the phenomena. And of course, they're already doing. That. And, and you so don't I, put it. You don't put this legislation into place either. Like, there's no reason to. If you're if you're planning to just keep obfuscating, you wouldn't. Schumer, who's basically representing the executive office, would not put this out. You know, like. Well, you well the Senate. This no well, committee Senate. would yeah. have made these moves, uh, uh, and so no, this is serious, serious business. But it is, it's not immediate existential. Uh, Ukraine is immediate existential. Yeah. Israel and Palestine's uh, endless conflict is immediate existential. Uh, Taiwan's risk of being invaded by China is immediate existential. I mean, so it's not that, you know, but it's extremely important. Okay. Oh, by the way, just another little uh, uh, vignette that, again, I find interesting to give you a sense of how these things go. 
David Grush comes forward on June the 5th because he has been harassed and got some relief, but not enough. Uh, Arrow was not able to respond to his information uh, and he was getting threats. And so he he did something pretty, pretty dangerous. He decided to come forward, not as a witness, but as a whistleblower. You don't want to be a whistleblower. There is a Whistleblower Act, Protection Act, it's been in play for some time, but you still don't want to be a whistleblower, trust me. It is not a path anybody wants to take. So, but he did it. And the reason he was a whistleblower is because he says that the policy is illegal and that, that ha it has to be illegal. You don't blow the whistle on illegal stuff, right? So it's illegal. He's saying, you're committing crimes. I know it. And I'm giving information related to that. I'm a whistleblower. And he, he wanted it done quickly because he didn't want to wait. And the big papers, the big networks simply could not do a quick job on that. I mean, there was no way. They have too much liability. A yeah. story of this magnitude, they were going to have to vet for weeks and weeks, and he wanted it out. And so they got it out. They went by the debrief, and they went by uh, Ross Colfart and uh, that interview. So it lands on June the 5th, and of course, sets everybody's hair on fire, except me, I don't have much to set on fire but the point is is that is that it was a huge deal we knew instantly and and and, and I, we were my my people and my were, were all at the, the citizen uh, i mean the contact in the desert conference in indian wells so that morning monday morning everybody's running around like chickens and wow and then of course the interview was scheduled for later that day we knew it was going to the news nation interview was going to be that later that day and so we all got together about 150 200 of us and we watched it together it was a pretty powerful moment, no question. And after it was over, we all went to a, the main room, the main ballroom, and did Q and A with Richard Dolan and Danny Sheehan. I think might have been somebody else up there. And again, everybody's really excited. It's a big deal. It's June the fifth. Okay. And what was the key part of it? Non-human tech and non-human bodies, which confirms Roswell, and more than one. So it confirms a, a lot. Big deal. Okay. June the 5th. Let's move forward. Only 39 days. It's 39 days. On July the 14th is when Chuck Schumer, out of nowhere, steps into the legislative process and announces that he is putting language into the next NDA bill, the UAP section. Now, he is not a member of the committee, but he is the you know, the majority leader of the Senate, and I'm sure that he can put language into any bill he wants. Uh, maybe he's a de facto member of every one of those committees if he wants to sit in. I don't know. I could easily look it up. The point is that it, it, we didn't expect this. And so Schumer steps in and, and, and talks about this language he's putting in. And lo and behold, what is the language that, 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 that the, the Senate majority leader is saying is going to be in the bill, or at least be on the Senate side? It includes a number of things, but what is includes got our attention uh, is that this bill makes it clear that all non-human tech from elsewhere in the hands of anybody in America, it really can't apply outside the U.S. That is the prop the the uh, the um, property of the United States government, eminent domain. Eminent domain. Got it. If we want it, we get it. Okay. Uh, and that message, of course, applies to everybody, including all the defense contractors, all of the USAP programs, right, that are buried deep and nobody even knows where the hell they are. You know, if you've been doing a little side work on some ET tech in your garage and you think you got something, yeah, it's ours. Uh, and then he went further. He said, within 300 days, we want a full report from everybody that has any of it. And that has to be presented to, I think, the era, if not the Senate Intel Committee. And it's implied, I think, that if you don't do that, there's going to be some serious consequences. So he is now, and what's what's powerful about this, a lot of people don't understand the bill process, but the language of the bill is, is going to come from the House and Senate reconciliation. And so the language goes up way ahead of the signing. And this, happen, this has happened in every case with the, our legislation, and it happens with most legislation, but it, and most times it doesn't, you know, it's not a big deal that the language is up, but it's up for people to review. And so anybody on the planet that can get to the Senate legislation site could read the text of any of the bills that are in play, the Senate version of it. 
anybody. And the Chinese communists, the Russians, teenagers, people working on USAPs underneath uh, you know, bases out in the middle of nowhere, everybody. And I'm sure the word gets around. And so a bill turn, a language like that turns up. Anybody connected to this issue goes and reads it. So he just sent a message to the entire military intelligence civilian complex that, in my view, any non-human tech is the property of the United States. And I want to report, we want to report on that. Even if it doesn't get into the bill, even if it gets taken out in reconciliation, that message has been sent. And they know, it just it confirms that, oh, maybe it doesn't make it into the bill, but you know, don't, don't make any long-term plans with your ET tech projects. So this was huge. And it comes 39 days after Grush. In other words, but it's more than just sending a message. Grush hug, hung that m massive matzo ball above the Congress. He said, we have non-human tech and non-human bodies. He said it under oath, and nobody in the government refuted it. And so that's just hanging there. Grush, of course, is already getting bothered, and, 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 and so there's going to be plenty of pushback against Grush. And there was definitely pushback against Grush. By making that action, by taking that action, Schumer basically shut it down. He basically said, I am the Senate Majority Leader, and obviously I believe Major David Grush, or I sure as hell that we put this legislation out there. All right, so he did that too. And he put his imprimatur on everything the Senate's been doing. He's basically saying, men and women, keep up the good work. See, a lot of people would notice that. It's my job to notice these things. And so that happened. Okay, so now it's it's July the 14th, and he is Schumer has just taken everything to the next level. So there's a consequence. I mean, there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of consequences from that, most of which we might know about, but one we do know about is that in the House, which has been pretty much off the field on this issue, with some minimal involvement, it's the Senate, it's the Senate intel. This House is sitting down there going, you know, damn it. We're the House of Representatives, and we're not, you know, potted plants down here. And we've been addressing the issue. Gallego wrote a little language. Andre Carson uh, held a, a briefing, not a committee, a hearing, but a briefing. You know, we're part of this, too. And by God, and plus, one of our members, Tim Burchett, has been aggressively speaking to the issue in multiple platforms. News Nation, Fox News saying, matter of fact, there's ETs here and talking about technology. And so by God, we're going to hold a hearing. And so they they throw together a hearing quickly, which under normal circumstances, I don't think they could have got because they're not, they're really not on the menu. The subcommittee of the House uh, Oversight Committee is not really on the menu for this. They, it's their, they're all, uh, not in play. Uh, it's not that they're not important. It's just that this issue is basically a Senate issue, a Senate intel issue. But they can have a hearing if they want one. And the reason they got one is because Grush clearly wants to get this out. So he was he wanted to get under oath as fast as he could. So they they knew they could probably get him, and they did. With if it was if they hadn't been for uh, Grush being there, they had might, may have tried to hold a hearing and go to get some witnesses. They don't have to go. They could have simply said, look, you know, we're waiting for the Senate Intel Committee. We're going to testify there. We don't want to testify. Them. And they'd have had to subpoena them. They're not going to do that. But Grush wanted out. So they got Grush. And once they had Grush, I think it would have been easy to get Fravor and Graves. So they got himself a nice little hearing of three military men, retired. Uh, and they did some prep. They did a good job. And they held this hearing. And they put his testimony under oath. The first whistleblower on this issue to ever testify under oath the first uh uh person to testify at all since 1958 i think they put the, the people under oath for the 68 hearing but i don't know for sure but they probably did uh so they got and they got huge press believe me i got it up on the site they were covered all over the world and Burchett became a public figure he's now invited to discuss numbers of issues on various programs it literally transformed his career from being a not well-known uh, Tennessee congressman to being a global figure. 
but again, it wasn't on the menu, right? And so this hearing happened. Uh, and what do you do, right? From my point of view, if I'm Warner and that has happened, uh, that just intensifies the, the need for me to hold a hearing. We just can't let that hang out there. We've got to get on here, right? Uh, and whatever he planned to do, uh, they held their hearing on July 26. And there was still plenty of upheaval in the Congress. There was already rumors that they were going to have trouble on a spending bill. Uh, and yeah, he, he he decided not to, uh, it wasn't a good time. And so he, he put it off. Uh, we know that they interviewed witnesses. Uh, some you know at home, that it, but still there were some interviews. So we know that the, there's a, plenty of witnesses available. And then of course the, there's been various things happening. Uh, I think the spending bill clearly was something they needed to deal with before they held these hearings. I mean they could have solved the spending bill much earlier, but no, they were going to run it out to the last day again because our, our Congress is com fundamentally in the collective completely incompetent and I mean and, and, and not not functioning, which is not good. Okay, it's not good at all. No one wins in this situation. So they dragged it out. And then, of course, uh, they finally signed the bill. But then the whole thing blew up in the House over the Speaker. And so, you know, when that kind of chaos, you can't hold what will be one of the most important hearings in the history of the United States. And so it just, and then, of course, the, the events in Israel. Yeah. So that's where we are now. Um, it's possible Jim Jordan is going to be the Speaker. That's going to be interesting for the House of Representatives, but not particularly significant for the Senate. But if we just get a speaker, then business, we can go back to business as usual. How long the events of this week are going to play out? We, we don't know. There's almost anything that can happen. We could have a full-fledged multi-country war in the Middle East within 10 days. Hope not. But, uh, uh, but we've been there before, and measures are being taken. Whether they're the right measures, only time will tell. But clearly, we we have we have a lot of historical precedent to work with. But I don't know. I mean, if if we may be lucky if we just end up with several dozen terrorist events in different countries killing quite a few civilians, we'd be lucky if that's all it happened. And no, you cannot hold a Senate hearing like the, on a subject like this while that's going on. So it's put it off for a while. And that's, I think, the equation that he's looking at, I would imagine. And I have no advice for him. I'm, I, I would not dare to presume that the right call is get the hearings done now, come hell or high water. I, ultimately, it would the outcome would be good. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. If we get disclosure, Things are going to change, and in fact, when the when the uh, when the when the terrorist attack occurred, um, somebody that I was going to be meeting soon, who is very interested in the issue and might be possibly someone that could provide substantial funding for multiple projects, that was very much. This individual went to Israel, not for other reasons. Thirty six hours before the attack and he's finally back and I was thinking what would I say to him because he, he he was traumatized big time he's a Jewish person that went back to Israel for a reason and this attack happened while he is in the country and he is seeing it on the news and I assure you in Israel they were not pixelating out all the bodies and they were not editing the footage to avoid upsetting the Israel people, Israeli people. They were showing the worst. So I think he saw that. So, and I'm trying to think, what am I going to say to him? What am I going to say to him in terms of moving forward on this issue? And what I would say is this. That event just confirms why ending the truth embargo is, the, is more, is this, it has to happen. It's just another reminder this has to happen. 
because whether it's the escalation of nuclear weapons technology, the risk of nuclear war, because the fact we keep having other wars, including ones as insane as the Ukraine war, or because China is just never going to give up until they get Taiwan. And that will be an absolute hell if that happens. All right. And we will be involved. And I could go on and on, but this is just one more example why we have to get disclosure. If we don't have this event and the worldview change that follows, everything you see happening in this world is going to keep happening. Everything. Trillions more. Untold trillions of dollars spent on weapons and, and bases and military and intelligence and everything related to defense and offense instead of feed clothing and clothing and housing people, right? Or dealing with the environmental issues. You know, it's all going to be spent on that stuff. And then, of course, there's going to be all the destruction that comes from these events. And ultimately, we're going to have a nuclear war. It's inevitable. We may still have it if we get disclosure, but the odds, I think, will improve dramatically. So the point is that, you know, it's awful, but it's not an excuse to delay disclosure. It is a, an imperative to get it done. Because there's many, many, many things like that can still happen in this world. There's so many unresolved, unreformed issues, unresolved uh, ancient grudges out there, and untold vast quantities of weapons uh, out there ready to be used at any time. So if we don't change course, we're toast. And a lot of people know it. People in their, in their, in their gut know this which is why they're fascinated with apocalyptic uh, film and TV. They can't get enough of it. They love it. One of, the, one of the most successful series of all time in terms of the total number of episodes, viewership and everything else, is about pretty much the same thing that goes on episode after episode in which former humans, now zombies, are, are, are shot in the head, stabbed in the head, Hold in the head and killed thousands of them, 240 some episodes. Why on earth would people binge watch that? I think I know. One, people are crowded and frustrated and angry at each other and seeing what were used to be people killed on mass like that over and over again just kind of releases a little tension you know people go you know I, i'd like to take a knife and kill you know seven people at work but i'm not going to do that but it's kind of nice to watch it but also it's basically an education people are watching this going yeah after the nuclear war yeah that's what i do yeah we need to get a group like that we need to build the fences like that we need to take care and operate this way. We need to make sure we got gasoline supply. Whatever the hell. They're literally in their mind seeing how you can make it in the post-nuclear apocalyptic era. That is the only thing. I mean, the acting was great. It's fine. No question. But 240 episodes of stabbing zombies in the head? No, it's got to be more than that. It's a, that... that Everybody alive today under the age of 76 lived every second of their life in the post-nuclear, I mean, the nuclear era, right? The nuclear era. They lived every second of their lives after the bombs in Hiroshima. They've lived their entire life during Cold War I and now Cold War II. They've lived their entire life under mutual assured destruction, knowing at some level or another that at any moment, it's gone. But hopefully it won't because the weapons are so awful we can't use them, except we almost have on about six, seven, eight occasions. This Damocles sword has been over the head of every single person alive today. And so everyone at some point, some level understands that at any moment it's over and you're living in the post-apocalypse. You're living in this hellscape. I mean, nobody really talks about that much. I mean, what other thing other than death itself virtually hangs over the head of every single living person? Uh, nothing except at this level, like the nuclear issue, the nuclear war 
issue. It's been treated in countless ways and countless movies and books and everything else, and that's fine. But Walking Dead basically was a university of post-apocalyptic survival, and people ate it up. Meanwhile, while that series is running, the wealthy are buy buying private planes so they can flee and not have to worry about getting a ticket. They're buying up so much real estate in New Zealand that it's driving the prices up, and they're building big bunkers underneath them. They're also building deluxe bunkers in the United States with swimming pools and libraries and whatever. You don't hear that talk about much. Politicians don't talk about it. That's for damn sure. But I can say any damn thing I want. And as an activist, I'm more than happy to connect all this together. Right? Is this the world we want? Do we want our kids and grandchildren, not that I have any, to be living under that same Damocles sword for the rest of the 21st century? Right? When the population will eventually get to 13 billion or something, and everybody is still thinking it'll all be over, do we think that's going to be manageable? And and if we spend another $100 trillion between now and 2060 or something on the usual defense, offense, weapon shit, the money that should be going to deal with the issues that face, do we think that people are going to be doing well? And what happens when five, six billion people aren't doing well? When they don't have enough water, they don't have enough food. What do you think they're going to do? Just lay down and die? That's not what history says. So this is this is not advanced calculus here. This is common sense. And there's not much common sense in American politics. I agree. That doesn't mean it couldn't return. But the ET issue ultimately becomes a hallmark and a touchstone for the, the dilemma of our time, which is we finally built the ultimate weapons. So awful we can't use them, but we almost have and we still could. And the art of war and the practicing of war, which has been endemic in human society forever, are great legends, a massive metal sculpture of Genghis Khan somewhere in Mongolia. I think. It just sits out in the middle of nowhere. It's quite impressive. The reason that sculpture is there is because Genghis Khan slaughtered unbelievable numbers of people, men, women, children, dogs, cats, goats. He would literally wade waste to everything. His attitude was, if you leave anybody alive, particularly kids, they'll grow up and come get you. And so you kill them all. He enslaved the women. He, he swept across Asia doing this, making him one of the great historical figures because he slaughtered so many and destroyed so much. Alexander is called the Great because he went across Asia and into North Africa and created the biggest empire of all time. It didn't last very long. One fight after another, slaughtering hundreds of thousands of people. In one case, he killed every single person involved in an island off the coast of uh, in the Mediterranean. Killed everybody because he was mad at them. And because he killed so many, he's Alexander the Great. You can go down through history over and over again. If Hitler doesn't help the, the rise of the Nazi party and end up leading Russia as a chancellor and has World War II and kills tens upon tens of millions of people, no one would even know his name. This is our history. We kill everything, anything, in huge numbers. There is no limit to what we will kill, including ourselves. Right? And we can't stop. We just can't stop. And lo and behold, when we finally get to the point where we have the ultimate weapons that can really take us all down finally, and we drop two of them in Japan, suddenly ETs are starting to turn up here and there. They'd already been showing up during the war as these, as these Foo Fighters, the, uh, the balls, kind of blowing balls. But all of a sudden, they're seeing sightings, 45, 46, not, not much made of it. It wasn't, it wasn't any media, hardly any media at all. Not much going on. But they were turning up, 45, 46. There's evidence they turned up at Trinity before when the bomb was being tested. We're going to learn more about that pretty soon. And then in 47, apparently there were so many flying around, they did some crash. We got, we got a crash vehicle. That's 47. And then he continued to show up. But overall, things were still quiet until in 52, they showed up on Moss over Washington, D.C. that tripped the beginning of the truth embargo, which I talked about. Okay. But think about that. 
we drop these bombs and all of a sudden ETs are showing up all over the place. And then they finally put on a big display over the capital, 52, while the Korean War is still going on and the Soviets are moving towards the hydrogen bomb tests. Interesting coincidence. And then the sightings continue all through the 50s as the nuclear Cold War starts to develop and mature. And then what happens in 62? Well, the inevitable almost event, right? Russia makes a bold move into Cuba. We find out about it. We have the Cuban Missile Crisis. 13 days or 18 days, I forget what it is. I watched it on TV every day. I was glued to the set. We learned later we almost had a nuclear exchange. We could have had a nuclear war in several ways. We didn't know at the time. There was the submarine case and the fact that we almost invaded uh, and they had nukes already on the island. And so we dodged a bullet October 1962. And guess what happened? Four years later, just four years later, ET craft come down and start hovering over our nuclear facilities and turning the weapons off. Coincidence? I don't think so. Not once, but a number of times. And not just here, in the Soviet Union. And at least one occasion in the Soviet Union and in the U.S., they didn't turn them off. They actually set them into launch mode, scaring the bejesus out of everybody, and then shut them off before they could launch. Coincidence? I don't think so. And so what we know is that there is a direct significant connection between the nuclear era that we entered in 45, 44, well, actually 45, and advanced aggressive ET activity. And it continues on until the present. And so in my view, and I've said it before, and I should put this in an extensive article, but I've got ADD. I can barely put 10 sentences together. I could talk for five hours, but I should overcome that I, or do something. But anyway, the point is, is that disclosure ultimately, I don't think is just about ending the truth embargo. From our perspective, it is, but from their perspective, it's something else. I believe they've had an agenda regarding the nukes all along, at least in the modern era. I don't know about ancient times, though I think they were around. And that agenda is simple. You're going to have to get rid of the nukes. And we're going to tell you about that. But first, you got to disclose because we don't want things to get too crazy. You know, acknowledge we're here. Get that out. Let your people get up to speed. Read all the cool books. Watch the docs. And once they're up to speed, the world is comfortable with the, uh, the reality of it we'll have open content. They say it's two years. So if we had disclosure this year, it would be sometime in uh, 2025, late 2025. Could be a year and a half. Could be early 2025. So in other words, there is another agenda here. That's their agenda. And open contact takes place because at that point, who's going to be upset? We've already known they were here. We've been confirmed it for, and we've been studying it for a year and a half. And now they're in open contact. Are people going to go crazy? No, they're going to want to know what they're talking about. And I believe what they're going to be talking about is the nukes. And so one of the agendas here is that ETs are going to address our nuke problem. Now, I get a lot of pushback on this. What people say is, no, they wouldn't do that. They, they will just turn them off if we, we launch them. Boy, that's, that's a hell of a gamble. I mean, talk about holding poker. That's all in, right? If you're wrong, you lose everything. And if you're right, okay, fine. They stop the nukes from flying, and then we have a discussion. But that doesn't seem to be the way they're they're acting and the way they conduct themselves. That's not the messages they give. They don't tell any of the contactees that, look, if you launch nukes, we'll turn them off. What they show them are images of what happens when we launch the nukes. Repeatedly, they've done this. Why show images of what would happen if we had a nuclear war, if you fully intend to prevent it? And so I don't think they will. And there, I can imagine some reasons for that. The point is, is that Okay, then what is their ultimate reason? I think there's two reasons that this is going to be in play immediately after open contact. Two reasons. One's us, one's them, in a sense. The first one is we are closing in on interstellar travel. Our physics is, is getting there pretty fast. Uh, I think we've We've got anti-gravitics, 
We got that from crash vehicles and we've got our own versions. But anti-gravitics is not the same thing as interstellar travel. It may be similar tech, but I don't think it's the same thing. There's another tech involved to get from one star to another and not have time dilation. And there are a number of people working on this. I'm following some of it. Uh, and that's just what's available, what you can find. I believe that we're closing in on it. I think we're not that far and 15, 20 years away from, from actually building the craft that can go to Alpha Centauri. Everybody claps. Fantastic. Star Wars, Star, Star Trek, real Star Trek. Yay. <laughs> Except there's a problem. You see, if you're an extraterrestrial civilization, here is what you know. The human race is advanced to the point where they're spacefaring and they're about to build a starship and be able to go out and visit stars. Great. But just 70, 80 years prior to that, they dropped two nuclear bombs on their own species without warning and vaporized and ultimately killed 120,000 people, mm -hmm. most of which were women and children or non-combatants, their own species. And they're going to build starships and they're going to put nuclear bombs on them because you never know what you're going to run into out there. About to become the empire for real. Yeah, and like, well, I was going to say, we are the empire in this scenario. <laughs> they can't let that happen. No. And people say, well, well how do you know that? It's simple. Imagine we had our starships, forget the ETs, and we traveled to Alpha Centauri and we find a planet like ours. And we, we learn that they've dropped bombs on their own people, their own species. And we then we learn that they're going to have starships pretty soon. What do we do? I mean, we're an advanced civilization. We've got interstellar travel. They're getting there. What do we do? Do we come home and go, don't say anything, but there's a planet in the Alpha Centauri system that's about to get starships and they, they actually have destroyed themselves. And I mean, they've killed you know, their own species with nuclear bombs. Let's hope they don't find us. You think that's what we're gonna do? No, we're gonna intervene somehow and make sure they can't do that because we have the ability to prevent it. And so I'm thinking that number one subject at, in open contact is you're not coming out here with the news. You're not allowed to join the big kids. We're just, you can't, you got to put those away. Finally, all the quarantine people will be right. I don't think we're quarantined. Don't have to be, but we will be. And so the idea, you know, you can't leave the solar system with the nukes. If you try to build a ship, it won't, it'll never fly because we'll just destroy it. Okay. Okay. And that's it. Okay. So fine. Point made. And some people go, oh yeah, absolutely. We'll get rid of them. And a bunch of other people will say, not, not in my uh, lifetime, my friend. We're going to never get up those things. And so what do you do? Maybe we concede and get rid of them. Okay, fine. Maybe we don't. If we don't, here's the next thing that comes up. And it's powerful. Okay, you can keep the nukes. You'll never be able to leave the solar system. Fine. But, you know, we have a whole lot of tech. We have a lot of the great advanced science and understanding that you don't have yet. There's no law of the universe that says we can't share. You do the same thing on your own planet. We can provide technology that could solve a great deal of your worst problems and help you build a safe and viable planetary civilization. But if you keep the nukes, we're not going to do a damn thing. Why should we invest our time to help you hang around a little longer until you blow yourselves up? Screw you. Right? So... You keep the nukes, you get nothing, no help from us, and you're quarantined. Ah, now that, that argument, right? Mm -hmm. You got the cure for Alzheimer's? Oh, yeah. Think you could add 20 years to our lifespan? Are you kidding? We can get you 50, right? You think you got water issues? No problem. We can arrange it. You can have all the water you need. And on and on and on. And the warmongers are going to have a problem. They're going to go, you know, well, no, no, no. I... We got to have the nukes, blah, and people are going to say, screw you, and they're going to do it. And so where this, I think, ultimately is heading is a nuclear-free planet, which opens the door for lots of conventional wars, right, which we already have anyway, or it is one part of the Great Reset and I use this term in a proper way, right? The Great Reset has been just bastardized to death, but whatever. And by that, I mean the Great Age of Reform. When we actually turn the corner as a mature spacefaring civilization, 
treat ourselves or other life forms on this planet and the planet itself like responsible, sentient beings. All right. Now, there's a hell of a lot to reform. Oh, my God. There's so many things to fix. But the only reason we don't fix things is we simply choose not to. It's not as if there's a problem we face now that we don't have a basic solution for. That We have a solution for virtually everything we face. We just choose not to ex exercise those. We just continue on and, and have the same outcomes and same results. So reform is about making a change. Reform is difficult, but it's always based on one thing, worldview. In order to end, in order to minimize racism, we had to go through a long process in which the worldview of an ever-growing number of people actually changed so that racism was not really a significant factor in that worldview. And once you get that, you you obviously get changes in behavior and policy. It's always about work. And our worldview right now is pretty well defined. And it's that that is expressing itself quite nicely in for the Middle East right now. What changes worldview? Well, in an individual basis, sometimes it's just reading a particularly good book. Somebody reads the Celestine Prophecy and their worldview completely changed. That's good. Or they find a guru and that can do it. On an individual basis, it can happen pretty easily. Any number of things can have a significant effect in your worldview. And all of a sudden, you're going off in a different direction. Fine. It's called self-help. But when you're talking about massive reforms of institutions and policies that affect, affect millions of people, there's, there's what? You're going to all hand them, a, all million, a couple million people with the book, you know, the cool book, and they're all going to read it and go, oh, no, they ain't going to read it. Changing worldview on a mass scale is incredibly hard, uh, even with Facebook. And so we need a worldview change on a level that is simply out of our reach. We can't do it. We don't have the means to create a worldview change like that, except one thing. Confirmation of the extraterrestrial presence is a global, universal worldview changer. Nobody escapes it. Everybody deals with it. It's fact. It's not conjecture. It's not fantasy. It's not text. It's not religious text. It is real. And it will be followed up by repeated confirmations. And so at some point, not far after disclosure, every living person on this planet will know that we are not the only sentient species in the galaxy, and we are being visited by a number of other sentient species with different technology. And they're going to have to fit that into that worldview. And when they do, it's going to start rearranging things up there. And they're going to start thinking differently. And then all of a sudden, when an effort to reform something gets into play, their worldview will support it as opposed to oppose it. And a reform project succeeds, and then another one succeeds, and another one succeeds. And thus we get to a better place. A place where millions of people don't love watching zombies be stabbed in the head in a post-apocalyptic hell. Right? That is where I think these things are heading. That's what I why I do what I do. And so far, nobody has ever tried to talk me out of that projection. No one. Because frankly, there isn't another interpretation that surpasses it, it that, that marries up with the facts. Right? Yeah. Uh, so until that comes along, I'm very comfortable with this. Now, admittedly, there's a whole other little thing happening over to the side, which complicates this. But it's a big universe and it's a complicated place. And that's the abduction phenomena. That's a separate thing. And disclosure is the only way we're ever going to find out. Open contact, maybe even, is we're going to find out the why behind it. Uh, and we need to know. I think we may not like the why, but we may appreciate it or understand it. There's a lot of things in this world now, in our own world, where we know what's something's going on we know why it's going on we're not happy about it but we understand why it was being done this could be one of those cases it's awkward on the other hand i i have a feeling a legitimate feeling 
that disclosure and open contact may very well bring an end to all of that. That unsolicited, involuntary contact with extraterrestrials might very well end completely for a number of reasons. It's just not appropriate and much more awkward and difficult and sends the right message. So disclosure in that case, in terms of it's, what, what does it mean and what does it, what does it do, it may bring an end to actions and things that are happening that are causing a lot of pain for people and upsetting them and creating serious problems. Not for everybody, but for most. And that's that's a positive. Okay, that would be a nice thing. Now, you know, I can't, I can't guarantee it. And I don't have hard proof. It is a logical projection of the pathway, the path that's the, what's been happening based on the evidence and what we know is happening. Uh, and that's all you can do, absent detailed information from all sources. And of course, the truth embargo has prevented that. But boy, have we done a lot of research on our own. I mean, I got this. This is only half of my bookshelf here. It goes off down there, right? And the number of books that have been written on the subject is a hundred times more. Than that. So That's we have a massive amount of knowledge. Yeah. It's not as if we're just poking it, you know, the air with this. I mean, we have, but there's a lot that we can work with to try to project where things are going. And of course we have the contactees who, when they started coming forward in the late seventies, early eighties, and continue to come forward, provided this font of information, not from one or two, but from thousands that viewed with you know, reasonable, uh, I, I think, approach, thinking, understanding that it's, it's, it's not, it's obviously going to be messy a little bit, still provided us information that we didn't know, uh, certainly from sightings and from any of the other research, the contactees were actually seen them, been with them, heard them, had images put in their head. And the only reason they're not in front of the committees right now is that that, that would be just more than our fine members of Congress could handle, right? Right, right now is straining them pretty much. If we had to bring, if we brought 50 contactees in there to testify to them, their heads would explode. They'd run screaming down the hall, but that's not going to happen. The contactees will have their day after disclosure without question. But that, but that doesn't mean we dismiss what we learn from them. And what we've learned from them is non-trivial. And my projection regarding disclosure and open contact in the nukes is very much based upon the contactee report. Not some single report, but the collective reports of thousands of them. And there's probably nobody that knows more about that than Willie Strieber, uh, who has gotten you know, hundreds of thousands of reports sent to him. His wife read every one of them. Unfortunately, she's passed. But I'm sure that she conveyed a lot to, to him. That That's pretty significant information. And unfortunately, it's just too much for the journalists that are just barely now getting their minds around UAPs and non-human tech. They're not ready to start featuring stories in the New York Times about contactees, but that day will come. And so all of that vast amount of information is still not available to or being looked at or certainly not being dealt with by the major media, but they will have to deal with it. But that doesn't mean we don't deal with it. And so again, uh, I can, I thank the contactees that have come forward bravely and out of the closet. Most of them are still in the closet, by the way, uh, and, and told their stories and painted the ETs and drew them, right? We know what they look like because of the contactees. The government knows what some of them look like because they've got their bodies, but they've hid those underground. The contactees have just drawn them for us. They're on the internet. That's pretty cool, right? So again, that's another reason why disclosure will change things dramatically. There you go. Just a short answer. I, I didn't want to get too long on that, but uh, talking uh, is what we do. It was it was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, the just the, painted the picture perfectly for. I mean, if you if you see a major hole in there, Anton, or if you if you if there's an issue about that that doesn't resonate with you, you're saying, well, ask because I I don't mind that. I I'd, I'd love to to uh, to respond to any any aspect of it that you're not sure about. Well, it's, I mean, I agree with most of what you said. I mean, pretty spot on, I would say, overall. Um, I think the sooner the information gets out, the better. Yeah. Um, I don't want you to think I'm, like, skeptical either. He, I'm he is not at all. <laughs> he is not skeptical. No. It's, it's okay. I, 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 yeah. don't, I don't flee skeptical. Okay. I mean, I do, I do like, 
debates and discussions and perhaps another time. I mean, if you want to go in, into more detail, I mean, I could talk about this for hours. I'm sure you can as okay. well. Yeah. Um, you know, the thing with, with contactees and, and abductees is um, that's another concern of mine is when that becomes more in the public discussion of like, these beings are, like you said, involuntarily contacting and in some cases taking them. Not that I don't, I personally don't think it's like a evil or nefarious reason. But the fact of the matter is that these beings are going into people's rooms. And, you know, I feel like the average person is going to be very concerned about that. Well, one thing that helps there is just like with the phenomena, basic phenomena. Guess what? There have been books, TV shows, and movies about contact and contactees, uh, some of them portraying it pretty awful. Uh, so they're out there, and plenty of people, I'm sure many hundreds of millions, maybe billions of people have seen some of this. So the idea of contact is in play, and it's been in play in a big way since the late 1980s. Whitley Strieber gets a huge amount of credit for that because his book Communion is a landmark book. Yeah. Uh, what it did was, and I've talked about this many times, but I love saying it, is, is that back then there were bookstores. You may remember there used to be bookstores, and, and uh, he was a best-selling author, very accomplished. So when he writes Communion, oh, his publisher went nuts. And so they, you know, they, they sold a lot of books. And the way you sell books is you stack them up in the windows of the bookstore. So when people walk by, they see, oh, no, that's a book, I got to buy that. Well, the book they stacked up for Communion had the face of a, 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 a gray on it. Mm -hmm. And so bookstores all over the country have his book with that face of a gray on it. And people are walking by, and particularly women were having flash memories. They were seeing that image, which they had never seen outside of their experience, and boom, memories were coming to them. And out of that came people coming forward and whatever, and stories started to emerge, plus the book is very candid about the experience from a, 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 a very uh, accomplished author. It wasn't fiction. And so for a lot of people, that opened the closet door for them. But the real modern era of the contactee gets started because of communion. And I remember the very first time I saw the book, of course, I read it. Uh, and then it continued to expand. And of course, so that, that, was, you know, that was 40 years ago. But now we have CE5 events going on all over the world. Uh, we have plenty of contactees to speak at conferences. We have contact organizations. We have regressionists that, that, that work with contactees around the world uh, trying to recapture memories. It's been going on for, for years. So it's pretty mature. And so when we find out, when it's confirmed, yeah, some people go, oh, I, I never really thought that was real. Um, but they're not a contact yet. Yeah. Right? In, other, in other words, you know, they're not a contactee. And so when they learn that it's happening, but it's not happening to them, I don't know why I'd get that upset. And the people that are contactees, they may feel tremendous relief because, hey, they just, their, their story is now confirmed and now people are going to believe them. And, and it, it's, a, it's a load off their mind. So again, the downside is hard to find. Yeah. It's difficult to find it. It looks like a pretty good deal all the way around. I think um, I, I'm going to respectfully disagree with that simply, okay. because, simply because if I was a parent and my daughter was being involuntarily taken by these beings and terrifying her at night, I mean, yeah, she's validated. She's validated. And I think a contactees need that. But speaking from the perspective of somebody who might not directly experience contact, I mean, I'd be like, I mean, just the, why are these beings taking people? And you have different stories. You know, you have people who have a lot of, I, I've read more positive than negative, but there are people who have negative experiences. Yeah, so it's I like, like I think that's where I start to look and I'm like, you're right. Absolutely. This might, this might get blown, blown up with like people with loved ones who are, who are dealing with this. And like, I mean, that's, that's where, that's my stance on well, that. And, and that's, here. The oh, children no, thing is, is, is definitely an issue. Yeah. A parent, the parent gets confirmed to them that the stories that children were telling them were in fact true and it's still happening. They're not going to be happy. And so you're going to have them uh, expressing substantial 
concern and anguish. Um, and that will have to be properly dealt with. Uh, of course, uh, at least, I mean, it, it will eliminate the rather painful situation where a member of the family is a contactee and the rest of the family simply can't buy it. And so now, you know, they could be uh, properly approached and dealt with within the family. So that's kind of an improvement. Um, but of course, there will be some issues. However, having said that, what can I say? If you just look at human behavior and what we do and what we conduct ourselves, we're creating pain constantly all over the place, constantly doing it. And I, I, I would, I, I think we're even better at it than the ETs. I mean, the ETs are definitely causing some angst in people by the activity, which I think it has a reason. Uh, but boy, the kind of stuff we do, oh my God. And so I, I'm trying to be, you know, not get too, too, uh, I was ext not extreme, but too overly concerned about it. I, to, but it, to, to ignore that would be a mistake, which is why I, I do bring up, I think, a legitimate point that open contact, certainly disclosure, and if not that, then open contact as well, that the ETs have to end that. They've had plenty of time to do whatever they're doing. Worst case, they could say, look, we have to make hybrids and uh, we have to continue to make hybrids. Um, and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, that would be that would be a problem. It would definitely would not help in the post-disclosure open contact era question. On the other hand, they could say, look, we will not do any more un, un, un non-volunteer contact. Only people that are willing to participate. I know it's genetic, but if you're in the, if they're willing to participate and they're in the genetic lines we're working with, then, then we'll do it. Maybe there's some compensation. That would certainly help. That's a possibility. It seems simple and trivial, but in fact, it's totally reasonable. They're sentient beings. Don't know. I don't know. But I know that um, I know enough about PTSD to know that not having it acknowledged is comparable in terms of its damage than the actual trauma itself. And so when the, when the Vietnam vets were not being acknowledged to having these problems, it was terrible for them. And finally, right, uh, it was acknowledged, yeah, these people are really suffering and they, they starting to do with it, but that at least the fact that they acknowledged it was helpful. And so I, I think that the confirmation of contact for most people that are contactees is going to be an improvement in their life. It may be troubling to their non-contactee family. I can get that. But Again, I think the focus should be on the contactees themselves and uh, uh, and this confirmation is clearly going to improve uh, their prospects uh, uh, it, 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 as opposed to hiding it or being told you're you're insane. And then of course, if you're a family situation, knowing that someone is a contactee, there's no doubt in your mind, it's been confirmed it's happening allows you to to treat them appropriately it allows you to do the right thing so how can that be worse than than in a situation where you don't know or you, you that you're being told something's happening but you deny it and so you're you, you could make it worse there's so many ways it could go bad it, it's the it, it's basically the whole thing about being in a closet being in a closet never helps anybody and closeting people is something we love to do and we're trying to get better at it so I, but I can't, I can't, I can't not but acknowledge that post disclosure and post contact will in some cases produce some significant upset. It will. Comparable to the kind of upsets that human activity pr presents, I don't think it will be in that ballpark. I think it'll be much less, but it will be there. And to not acknowledge that is, is to undermine one's, someone's, uh, legitimacy as a as an analyst analyst and 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 someone studying it. and and so i i try not to go too too far there uh i don't i don't i try to minimum i don't let me put it this way 
it doesn't serve an activist to paint a bleak picture of the outcome of success. Uh, and so you have to always consider that. Uh, in other words, if you're in the civil rights movement in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you, it's not a good thing for you to start talking about all the awful things that will happen after a civil rights act is passed because there, well, some things did happen, right? And and get into that. It, it, it's a it's a truth, and it, and it could be the case, but people are much less likely to commit to the to the work and the activism if you're talking about all the things that will go bad once you achieve this prize. So you have this balance. On, on, and then it's also the case in order for activism to succeed, people got to participate and therefore they have to have some belief and confidence that they can succeed. And so if you're if you're not supporting them, you, you're, you're going to lose. And so, you know, saying, you know, I mean, I've had people tell me that there, there'll be no disclosure in our lifetime. OK, fine. Can I prove that there won't? No. All right. Could I say, well, it's quite possible, folks, that we'll never see disclosure in our lifetime. I could say that. And I might even be right. But from an activist point of view, that's nuts. If there's not going to be disclosure in our lifetime, why should anybody care or make even the slightest effort to end the truth embargo? So, boom, you've just, you just pretty much cut the rug out from under yourself. I don't believe it. I think it'll happen way sooner than that. I think it's very soon. So I emphasize that and not emphasize the fact that it's possible. That it'll never happen in this century. You can't lead activist, uh, activism that way. You just can't do it. You have got to instill study sense of achievement and the possibility you can get it done. And if you are right, and it was if what you're trying to achieve is right, no harm, no foul. But then that's where you get into an, uh, an interesting area. In other words, every activist gets into a cause of great importance has to make a decision that the prize is right it's just it's what has to happen but they could be wrong and you have to always expect that that you could be wrong and if you if if you as an activist finally conclude that wait a minute we can't do this then if you're a, a righteous person you 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 leave you drop out right Obviously, I believe where we're going is absolutely the right thing to do. I have no intention of dropping out. But it's just never that simple. There were people, even up to the last days of the uh, leading up to the Civil Rights Act of 64, there were still plenty of people, legitimate people, who were making the case that if they, if they get that act, that ultimately is going to bring, bring the end to segregation, that the life for people of color in the South would be worse. And they would list all the bad things that would happen because of the end of segregation. And they were making the case, don't do this. Don't rock the boat. Let's take, let's just let this organically work out over time. And eventually we will see the mountaintop. There were people doing that right up until the end. But the activists that were leading the movement believed at their deepest level that a civil rights act was the right thing to do and they were going to get it come hell out of the water and they were right and the, and the voting rights act that followed they were right about that one too but every activist still faced that if you're going to do this you're trying to make something happen and if you're wrong if it's really something that shouldn't happen then boy have you screwed up and wasted a lot of your time and not all activism is clear cut there are a number of activist movements that are very very tricky in terms of is it the right thing to do particularly in the area of the environment environmental activism which is it's just way more complex than the disclosure activist movement i mean it covers so many areas and genres and, and situations and in many cases the activists are probably wrong and if they actually get what they want and there have been cases when they got what they want it was a mistake I'm not going to throw shade on people that ended up with the wrong outcome because they were wrong about the premise. Uh, they were trying to do the right thing. Almost every case, they believed it. But it's important that an activist always keep it in mind. You could be wrong. 
and every periodically you just want to take a little you know take a moment and run a test you know one of those self checks you know, like you do in a car and it's going to run the tech and go through the things and say is this the right thing to do is the outcome the right thing to do is and and go yeah no it is and continue on uh, i have never had a doubt i think that's very very well said um yeah. i definitely think so the where i was trying to go with that it was um i agree like we want the big D. I mean that in every way possible. <laughs> um, my concern is post disclosure and ways as activists to help mitigate some of the potential problems like coming up. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's pretty much that my that's my main focus. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I want to get to the actual disclosure, like everybody else. Oh yeah. But I ask these questions because I like to. I like to probe minds more in tune than mine <laughs> on the topic just to kind of get there i like getting different people's opinions on this on, on this perspective because it's going to be very important in the coming coming months and years the post disclosure yeah. era will be unlike anything the human race has ever seen uh it will be a self-education diy program unbelievable scope where basically the whole planet, to one degree or another, is going to educate, self-educate itself. I compare it to the computer revolution. Uh, a lot of people don't remember, but we went from not having any computers at all to everyone having a computer and figuring out how to use them. But what they forget is that only a tiny percentage of people ever went to a school and studied it right? They just got one and tried to use it. So how did they ultimately succeed? Tech support. The, the, the rise of the computer in our society was built on the backs of hundreds of thousands or God knows tech support people, educating people who are calling in on the tech support line and driving them crazy. Uh, and trying to, to explain to people that would, don't even know what an electron is, how to get this done and how to make that work and how to use this software. And it went on for years and it cost a lot of money. But this, the tech support university is what somehow trained untold millions of people how to use the damn computer, how to use the software until eventually pretty much everybody that needed to know kind of knew. Uh, and of course, there was more and more schools, more and more classes, and people would took two classes, things like that. But the tech, the tech people have not been given the credit. The tech support people, without them, it, it, there's no way it could have worked. Why? It would have taken decades longer. And so they, they, I, I don't think they were paid that well either. And so that was a self learning curve that took us from zero computers in the hands of people to everybody having them, using them, and all that stuff. And it, and it, and it, and it basically took about twenty five years, not nah, twenty years. 1995 to 2015, I think we were about five. Okay, this is going to be sort of like that, uh, except that it's not going to be tech support people. It's going to be the entire governments of, of, the, country, of the world uh, bringing information out. It's going to be all the journalists bringing information out. Uh, and guess what? The internet which the tech support people trained us to use is now going to be the tool that's going to train us about yep. all things extraterrestrial past and present. The computer reaches everywhere. And so we have the ability now to bring an entire planet up to speed on an issue of this magnitude in two years or less. I think a year is all you need. Wow. Because I assure you what people are properly motivated. Oh boy, you got their attention. And so everybody in the planet is going to want to know about this and they're going to go to the computer and they're going to start doing it and, 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 and organizations are going to serve them and you're going to have all kinds and then you're going to have documentaries and whatever. And, and the film industry is going to be involved, which is why I'm in Hollywood, why I'm out there and I'm, I'm help, trying to help that happen in my modest way. Uh, it's going to be an extraordinary time where an entire planet gets up to speed on an issue of this profundity in about a year, two year and a half times so that everybody is suddenly walking around, you know, oh, sure, sure. What do you think of the latest uh, species that we just learned about? Well, you know, they're interesting. I, I don't know if they're intellectually as capable as the greys, 
uh, but they may have implants, whatever. And they're talking about extraterrestrial, you know, in, you know, in, uh, interstellar travel. It's like, you know, the system we've got is like, okay, but I, I, you know, I think we need something better. Well, you know, who's working on it? I mean, it's going to be like that. In that year, year and a half afterwards, they're going to be teaching ETs at most of the universities. There's going to be a, probably a Department of Extraterrestrial Affairs at the cabinet mm -hmm. level of the United States and most of the government. It's, people are going to pour into science like crazy. I mean, kids are going to be lining up to, to, assuming they can afford the tuition, to study math and physics. I mean, it'll be the golden age of science, post exposure. These are the things that I can confidently say are going to happen. This is all pretty good stuff. Yeah. And 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 after that learning curve is peaked, what happens if ET show up and want to have discussions with world leaders? People are going to go and say, "Oh yeah, fine, just to." Uh, email me you know keep me you know <laughs> sign up for the newsletter okay so i know everything that's happened cnn will be covering it intensely you know this species is talking to that leader today here's what transpired and all that kind of stuff and people will take it as normal one of the reasons there's eight billion of us on this planet is that we are capable of normalizing anything it is our great skill it's it's a, an adjunct of our intelligence and other factors and so if things get really awful, after a certain amount of time, we normalize it. And it's like, that's the way it is when we function. If things get really, really good, after a while, we normalize that. And we assume that that's normal. That's what happens all the, all the time. And we take it, for, take it for granted. We constantly do this. Like in marriages, you marry the love of your life in about six months, it all seems normal and not particularly exciting anymore. <laughs> we just do that. It's, it's part of our survival. It's why there's so many of us. We can normalize anything, and therefore we can almost cope with anything. And we will normalize the ET presence until talking about it, in many cases, will be boring as hell. And we'll do it quickly. Now, that the fact that a lot of people may get bored with it after a number, a number of years or whatever doesn't mean that we're not going to be full-fledged engaging right, the galaxy and building starships and mining asteroids in our system and whatever else we can do in a post disclosure world where anti-gravitics is now available to the public and starships are functional. All of this could be part of our world and could have been part of our world five, 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe even 25 years ago. But it isn't because the government decided to embargo the issue for the reasons that I've discussed. Now that embargo is going to end. And so all the things we just talked about are coming. They're inevitable. They have to come. Right? And all the sci-fi that you've watched will come in handy. Not the gal Barty and the Galaxy stuff, but streaming series like uh, The Expanse, which is unbelievably good, right? And other series like that. Uh, it's going to be an amazing time. Uh, I just, and, and I'm hoping it's so amazing, so engaging, so promising that China will decide, you know, who cares? The galaxy doesn't care whether we have Taiwan and don't have Taiwan. They could care not even that much. It's utterly irrelevant on that level. So the hell with it, you know? Let's just get some treaties and do business with each other and stop this crap. Now, some other things will be a little tougher. The ancient conflict between the Arab world, the Jewish world, won't resolve so easily, right? But its chances are better. Uh, and all other territorial disputes. India want to go to war with China over Kashmir? The galaxy could give a flying heart about Kashmir. There's a whole galaxy out there. Why are we going to go to war and kill people of this little tiny piece of land? It's in the mountains, for God's sakes. This sounds trivial, but in fact, that, that's in play, yeah. post disclosure. All of this is in play. What is important when you suddenly learn that you're in a galaxy filled with multiple species and only a little tech is preventing you from actually hanging out with them or engaging any number of things in a number of ways? What? Why would that not change our thinking on just about everything? Um, it, it's it's so obvious to me. And of course, it's been, you know, Gene Roddenberry, who probably was a contactee and had substantial contacts to people inside government. I think he knew a hell of a lot when he created Star Trek. 
and he was he was thinking along the same lines that this is the kind of at least the, the ship was representing a a a an earth that had gone through this age of reform i'm talking about but in order to get people to watch it you had to have some wild west shoot 'em ups and all that crap but overall he tried to keep it down uh and the later series kind of kept it down i don't think that's the way it is in other words i think the ets would watch a star trek and go oh really <laughs> you've got <laughs> to be kidding right you don't think we can do that shit do you um but i think that he saw it there is still a tech foundation by the way it still exists i'm, I'm still I'm trying to hook up with it maybe i'm going to be looking for it i did see something the other day that exists to keep audenbury's core worldview alive right and so they're doing stuff called, i think it's called the tech foundation uh that still exists uh and there have been other efforts to try to demonstrate this kind of post-disclosure uh concept but not many not too many um but we'll I think we're going to see more coming out of uh, Hollywood and the film industry very soon. Uh, I think the post-disclosure world, I think I've been working to make them aware of it. I'm, I've been trying to do what I can, but others have more powerful than I have stepped in now. And so don't be surprised if the post-disclosure world doesn't become a, a thing. Because let's face it, uh, the, the number of stories and concepts that you can address from the standpoint of the post-disclosure world is virtually unlimited. Right? Yeah. Now we do have movies about a world where ETs are, are accepted and so forth, but they're mostly just entertainment. They're not serious efforts to try to engage what a post disclosure world would be like in theatrical form, even fictional form. But that's coming. And they're gonna they're gonna do well. They're gonna have great audiences and they're gonna help us understand this. And I have an announcement about that coming in three weeks. Uh, so exciting. that's going to be my my part of uh, this process nice okay well that's good uh i'm gonna say we have to wrap it up because my computer is not going to be able to take much more of the recording i already lost the audio i mean we the audio is also on this so we're good but i was just like oh we're done <laughs> that's why but, they da vinci resolve and uh, yeah mm -hmm, exactly so well, i appreciate it yeah this has been wonderful if you ever want to come back you know we'd love to have you in the future um and just yeah thanks for for everything i mean anton if you have anything to say no i just want to say i'm, I'm deeply honored to have you on and yeah. your inspiration to all, all the activists out right now i mean you've been in it longer than anybody as far as i know and um yeah thank you for your time uh, steve greer's been it longer than i but yeah. Uh, oh, has he? Yeah, ten years longer than I. He, he's basically an actor. Uh, but okay. I appreciate it, Anton. Look, uh, this is when I do this. I'm literally formulating expressions and language. Literally, when I'm able to do this, because I do not speak from scripts. I never speak from scripts. It's always extemporaneous. I can't do it. I don't have the memory, and and it's, it's and I think, and so this kind of opportunity to really get into it at length it's helping me enormously because it, it makes it easier for me to express this uh I, I, you know over and over again or whatever in other contexts so uh it's one of the nice things about podcasts you can just go on and on and on if they exactly like and, and it's just more content <laughs> promo time i do my promos okay um let's see first and foremost uh an activist is only as powerful as his twitter account and his twitter followers i need more so I'm at, at Steve Bassett, right? Uh, but the, I guess you could say the name is Paradigm Research Group. Either one will get you there, at Steve Bassett. Please follow and share and retweet what you see there. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. Uh, got a number of accounts there. Steve Bassett, Paradigm Research Group, ExoPolitics World Network. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, right? So you can easily find me on LinkedIn. These are... You know, you just can't have too many followers if you're an activist on these social media, particularly Twitter and LinkedIn as well. LinkedIn is a very good network source. Um, also, uh, we've got some serious conferences going up. Uh, on November 10 to 12, Disclosure Fest Foundation. That's its name, literally, Disclosure Fest Foundation, which is uh, run by Adrian Valera is holding a massive conference at the Luxor Hotel in, in Vegas. 
Uh, they've already booked a thousand rooms. They'll probably book another thousand uh, between now and the event. It's about 60 speakers. There's a substantial UAP content there. I'm going to be monitoring an incredibly po powerful panel on, on disclosure, including Danny Sheen, Richard, Schult uh, Richard Dolan, and others. And of course, it's a Luxor Hotel. It's in a pyramid. But it's really, it's really the Conscious Life Expo in a pyramid is what it is, uh, run by different people. That's going to be a significant event. They still have rooms, so check it out. November 10 to 12, it's called Stairway to the Stars. What else could be called? Stairway to the Star. And there's another very significant event coming up in Mexico City, December 1 to 3, World, World Ufology Conference. Mm -hmm. This is a Spanish group, a Spain group. It has been holding these around the world, and they're very substantive, and they're, they're attracting a, a lot of substantial audience. Now, this event... I can't imagine. Uh, Mexico has the highest probably awareness level in the general population on this issue than any country in the world. It's higher than the United States. There's reasons for that. Uh, Jaime Lusan is one of them, but overall, they've just had so many uh, the sightings down there and, and so much interest that OVNI is like just absolutely completely manifest. Mexico City has 25 million people. So we can assume that this conference is going to be pretty well attended. Uh, so this is the World Ufology Conference, Mexico City, December 1 to 3. And then Contact in the Desert next year, June 2024. Contact in the De Desert changed hands and is now owned by people that I'm uh, affiliated with. I'm helping to promote it. Uh, we had we brought the conference back from difficulties that were brought on by the, the, the uh, pandemic, which really hurt it bad, but it hurt everybody that and we had a successful review a re debut about 1200 people we'll easily double that uh this coming june and it's going to be and of course there's going to be some things happening between now and june so this conference could be intense uh i want you and i hope we'll be there it's indian wells contact in the desert i do not think that actual dates are set however keep checking on their website contact in the desert.com because if you want to come to that conference, you've got to book your hotel as soon as possible. Trust me on this. You've got to do that, right? Unless you want to, you know, you've got an RV and a tent. Uh, and if you and if you want to be in the hotel, absolutely, you've got to book it as soon as possible. So that's coming up. There is a conference in San, San Mar, Mar, uh, Marino, Italy, uh, on the 20, I'm sorry, it's November 4 to 6. I was supposed to speak. Unfortunately, I canceled, I had to cancel. Um, it was tough, tough to, to get there in, in, in my schedule, but the situation in the Middle East essentially made it inappropriate. I just couldn't go. Uh, so I had to pass. Uh, I, I don't want to be out of the country over the next 30 days. It's not a good idea. So I had to cancel, but it's still going to go on. San Marino, you can find it. It's on the uh, CUN, which is the uh, uh, Italian uh, ufology group, uh, uh, Roberto Panati is running it. And Roberto has been getting a lot of coverage and doing a lot of things. Uh, uh, you may have noticed that uh, in the post a tip era or the post uh, uh, to the stars era. So that conference is coming up. Um, and I want to mention again that Danny's think tank is up and running new paradigm Institute. Uh, he is a nonprofit and that, that institute is going to be based on donations. So don't hesitate to donate once you find, find out where it is. I think they're still putting stuff together. I think the site is up, but I'm not positive, but he, he just got initial funding. And I'm going to have PRG converted to a nonprofit in about three or four weeks. Uh, finally, first time, it'll be a nonprofit under the District of Columbia. I'm able to accept donations that are tax deductible. Uh, and I will convert the, I will modify the website to convert PRG from a just an activist organization to a think tank, uh, a mini think tank, small, much smaller than Danny's, but still uh, a think tank located two blocks from the White House. Not a bad idea. So uh, watch for that, and I'll be out you know, trying to get some donations to uh, uh, get PRG up and gunning as a, a nonprofit. Sooner, the, so, I'd like to get that done before the the hearings, but. I'd be happy to see those hearings happen right away. And I think, I think I'm just about covered it. 
except for the one announcement I can't make. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. One of my colleagues just dropped a film uh, just not long ago, about 10 days ago. It's called, uh, it, the title is something you'll be hearing a lot about. Uh, the phrase will be everywhere. We are not alone. Mm. Documentary. We are not alone by Elysium Media. Check it out. It's not bad. Uh, and of course, Ron James's documentary "Accidental Truth" continues to get awards. I think he's got four more. He's up to twenty-four, and that's that's available on streaming. Uh, also, I should remind everybody that Steven Spielberg stepped back into this issue in a big way with a documentary series, not a fictional series. He hasn't done that. He's made some of the most famous ET movies of all time. He made one of the biggest series, well, at the time, the biggest streaming series ever, Taken, 20 Hours, which was about contact, but it's fictional, all right, scripted. Now he's going into documentaries. The series is called Encounters. It's on Netflix. It's doing very, very well. Four different cases, four obviously high production value docs, uh, essentially. Uh, there's only, as far as I know, there's only one kind of mistake which I think could have been avoided if there had been a little more back and forth between his people and the producers and the people in our field that really know the history of this. In the in the show where they dealt with the Ruach case, they gave time to a gentleman who got a little publicity and attention by claiming the whole thing was a hoax put on by him, which is categorically false. Uh, and obviously upset many of the now fully grown children. So that was a mistake, but that's okay. He's done four series there, he's back. And again, if Steven Spielberg wants to do 20 more, he can do them. And who knows, he may have starting to help some of the people in the field. So there's another sign of a change that's coming. He's always stayed back. He, 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 he puts these amazing movies out and then he gets asked about the issue and he always demurs, he always steps back. He doesn't want to go there. I think soon we're going to find out what Steven Spielberg really thinks about this subject. Uh, but he's played it, you know, his films have been landmarks in terms of opening people up to the issue. Close Encounters of the First Kind, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, it was just a major movie for a lot of people. Taken, obviously, wasn't as well known as seen, but pretty significant uh, series, 20 hours. Uh, so we, and, and so we know how important he is and, and i'm hoping to see him engage this issue uh, in robustly and that'll happen but he's not the only major player in, uh, in hollywood that is realizing it's time and that's another reason why the truth bar was yep. over i mean once the big guys decide okay we no longer are going to stand back and just make fictional movies that make a billion bucks we're going to make really well-funded documentaries that and put them up on the big screens hopefully and also on the big streaming services truth embargo can understand that. okay that's my promos thank you so much yeah until thank next you. time All right mm -hmm. uh we'll talk again yeah that'll be good okay i'm Tom. goodbye <laughs>